Good morning. Oh, good afternoon. Sorry. We've been here since morning. So. Welcome to our October 26, 2021 board business meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are joining us here today. For those of us here in person, please remember that masks are required to be worn in this building. So we ask that you remain properly masked for the duration of the meeting. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the MCPS website and MCPS TV. Let us begin by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will now call the roll to recognize board members to establish that we have a quorum, starting with Dr. Daca. Good afternoon, Judy Daca. Ms. Mandrowski. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Silvestri. Good afternoon. Ms. Evans. Good to see everyone. Hello. Ms. Harris. Good afternoon, everyone. And Ms. Aluni. Good afternoon, everyone. And we are also joined at the table by Dr. McKnight, the interim superintendent. Now we'll begin with the approval of the agenda. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Dr. McKnight, would you like to go to item three? Yes, thank you, Ms. Uh, President Wolf. So I bring forward our human resources development uh, appointments for today for approval. One at a time. Okay, I'll proceed with the first. Um, our first appointment for today is Mr. Dan Kelly. As Director of Financial Services, Division of Financial Services in the Office of Finance. Mr. Kelly has been employed with Montgomery County Public Schools as an assistant controller and most recently as acting director of financial services. Mr. Kelly brings to MCPS more than five years of auditing experience. He looks forward to working with the financial services team and supporting MCPS and the community. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Congratulations, Mr. Kelly. Next, we bring forward Mrs. Phoebe Kwan as Director of Investments in the Department of Strategic Planning and Resource Management in the Office of Finance. Ms. Kwan has been employed with MCPS for the past year as a Senior Investment Officer and most recently as Acting Director of Investments in the Office of Finance. Mrs. Kwan brings to MCPS more than 15 years of experience in investment asset allocation, and portfolio monitoring. She looks forward to supporting the investment implementation and management retirement system and contribution plans for teachers, staff, and retirees. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Congratulations, Ms. Kwan. And uh, next, our final appointment is Mrs. Gina Rapoli as director in the Employee and Retiree Service Center in the Office of Finance. Mrs. Rapoli has been employed with MCPS for 22 years as an, a, <clears throat> as an office assistant, secretary, payroll assistant, user support technician, data support specialist, workforce reporting specialist, data integration specialist, senior specialist, and most recently as coordinator in the Department of Employee and Retiree Service Center. Ms. Rapoli looks forward to supporting MCPS employees, retirees, and their families on employment-related business, including benefits, leave compensation, and retirement. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Congratulations. Okay, we now move to recognitions. Thank you again, President Wolf. So we do have several recognitions today. I'll start with the first, which is a recognition for National School Bus Safety Week. 
The week of October 18, 20 through 18 through the 22nd, 2021, has been designated as National School Bus Safety Week. Our school bus transportation is more than a ride to and from school. It is access to education. School buses widely are recognized as the safest form of ground transportation. Each student riding a bus will, should have safe and secure environment that sets a positive tone for the day to foster a high level of learning and success. The current public health conditions require a specific focus on safety for staff, students, and families and requires adjustments to practices to ensure safety, such as front and rear bus window open for circulation, enhanced cleaning protocols, and all school bus occupants wearing face coverings. School transportation employees across the country and here in Montgomery County have served and contributed to the overall safety and security of the community in many non-traditional ways during COVID-19. MCPS needs more members of the community to serve students by becoming the next great school bus operator, helping us return transportation to peak performance. So now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education proclaims the week of October 18th through the 22nd as National School Bus Safety Week. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Our next recognition is recognition for National Native American Heritage Month and Day. Montgomery County Public Schools is located on the traditional land of the Piscataque, Mahaco, Akaskan people. We gratefully acknowledge the native peoples in where ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities that make their home here today. During National Native American Heritage Month and Day, we celebrate the traditions, languages, and stories of the first Americans who helped shape the future of the United States throughout its history. In 1986, the United States Congress passed a law to authorize and request the president to make a proclamation recognizing Native Americans as the first inhabitants of this country and the contributions they've made to medicine, literature, the arts, sports, and infrastructures. Native American Heritage Month serves as an opportunity to celebrate the rich and diverse cultures, traditions, and histories of Native Americans, to educate and raise awareness of the many tribes, their geographic locations and languages, to acknowledge the unique challenges that Native American people have faced in the past and continue to face to this day, and how tribal citizens have worked to conquer those challenges. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Interim Superintendent of Schools hereby declare the month of November 2021 20, to be observed as the Native American Heritage Month in Montgomery County Public Schools, and that Friday, November 26, be observed as Native American Heritage Day. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. And our final resolution is to acknowledge National School Psychology Week. The National Association of School Psychologists has designated November 8th through the 12th, 2021 as National School Psychology Week to recognize the important work of school psychologists to support students' learning and well-being. The theme for this year's National School Psychology Week is let's get in gear, grow, engage, advocate, and rise. The theme's acronym provides a challenge to grow both personally and professionally. It encourages us to engage in best practices and advocate for children's access to mental health and learning support. To rise implies resilience and renewal despite the challenges of the past. This has a particular resonance this year as we work to assist students, families, and school staff to emerge from the challenges of the pandemic. When we get in gear, we move together. When one gear moves, the connected gears move as well. When we move together, there is a positive synergy that builds and becomes greater than any single effort. School psychologists and school staff may grow together, we engage critical systems, and we advocate and rise together. It is appropriate that Montgomery County Public Schools recognize the critical role of school psychologists. Now therefore be it resolved that the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Interim Superintendent of Schools hereby proclaim November 8th through the 12th, 2021 as National School Psychology Week in Montgomery County Public Schools and recommend observance by all of our school communities. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous, thank you. Our next item on the agenda is public comments. Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views 
and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, or other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. With this board meeting, we have resumed live public comments and have 11 persons signed up to provide in-person testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. When your name is called, please approach the podium. Keep your mask on, but speak clearly and directly into the microphone. Your mask should be properly worn over your nose and mouth. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same button once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have two audio testimony and seven video presentations. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on board docs where they are posted with the other materials for this meeting. Our first speaker will be Katie Yuan. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and members of the Board of Education. My name is Katie Yuan, and I'm here to talk about an issue that MCPS has failed us in time and time again, financial literacy. Today, I'm speaking as the founder of InnovateX, a student-led nonprofit spearheading personal finance reform in MCPS, a founding member of the MCPS Personal Finance Workgroup, and most importantly, a lifelong student of the MCPS system for the past 10 years. This past year, NOVX and the MCPS workgroup have shown the need for a solid financial literacy education through thousands of MCPS survey responses, hundreds of emails written to the board, and finally, the MCPS students here today to testify. Now think back to when you first bought your house, a car, or paid taxes. It wasn't easy, was it? For some, it may have been under the guidance of parents, but for most, it was self-taught and skill learned over time through trial and error. Not every student has the luxury of having mentors or the time to teach themselves the basics of financial literacy with school and job responsibilities. If the budget is ever a concern, Dr. Alan Cox from the Maryland Council of Economic Education has offered to provide free professional development for all MCPS teachers in personal finance. If there's any doubt about its feasibility, Prince George's County just next door has already set precedent. As you're considering the futures of more than 160,000 MCPS students, I urge you to vote in favor of the financial literacy graduation requirements and carry out work recommendations to ensure that no MCPS student will ever once again have to fear about their financial futures. Thank you. Next is Rodney Peel. Press the button. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the Board of Education. Uh, as you were just saying, you know, we don't use this venue uh, for personal issues and things like that, that we should use existing avenues of redress and complaints. Uh, but most parents don't really know how to do that, or they're afraid to try, or they find the process unfair. So thank you for your decision last summer to review regulation KLRA on responding to inquiries and complaints from the public. 
which I think you'll be talking about more this afternoon. Um, in a dozen years as an MCPS parent, I've made formal and informal inquiries and complaints to you as board members, to local school principals, to central office staff, superintendent, the State Board of Education, and even the uh, Maryland State Department of Education. And I've consulted with and heard from many other parents who had their own complaints, but I never even knew about that resolu the, the regulation or that used that complaint form. And filing a complaint is really a daunting process for a family. We're not sure when or whether we have cause to complain. And we feel like MCPS treats us as if no one else has the same concern, even when there's a line of people outside the principal's office with other families with the same issue or comes up again and again. Um, and then when we fail to receive an adequate response at the local level, we don't know how or don't have the time to go up the chain of command to appeal a decision. So the process we feel, like I said, we feel is not fair to families. Um, but since it's under review, we'd like you to be sure to catalog all the alternative processes and the appropriate venue for them because some will be applied under this new regulation, but many have, are subject to other rules and requirements. Um, the regulation also requires, already requires schools to periodically announce the availability of the form compl for complaints. So I think the communication can be improved and that's part of the, the message today. Um, I have additional comments uh, in my written remarks. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Next is Deborah Berger. Good afternoon, members of Montgomery County Board of Education and Dr. McKnight. I'm Deborah Kornbluth Berger, and I'm the school chair of the Lux Manor Citizens Association, representing over 900 households. I'm mother of three successful Walter Johnson High School graduates and a current eighth grader at Tilden Middle School. And I currently serve as cluster representative of Tilden Middle School as well. The Lux Manor Citizens Association supports full funding of the CIP, including phase two of the Woodward High School building. Option 1A design as presented by MCPS is completely supported by our association. These funding decisions give the community the strongest educational opportunity for the students. By including athletic stadiums, a track, separate baseball, as well as softball fields, an ancillary gym, an auditorium, and music and art program, our students will be given the opportunity to develop parity within the Montgomery High School program. MCPS must give students the opportunity to avail themselves of Title IX educational programming. A high school stadium provides so much more experience and far of a football game. A stadium aff affords opportunities for soccer, lacrosse, girls field hockey, marching band, palms, track and field, as many other activities. It is a place of school spirit. Our association recognizes the need for Woodward as a holding school for Northwood High School and alleviating the overcrowding at Walter Johnson High School and the DCC. Ongoing developments within the White Flint community continue to impact all aspects of community life, including the overcrowding of schools, traffic, stormwater issues that flood our homes. In conclusion, LCA supports the full funding of phase two using option 1A. I've also given written testimony with more details. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Next is Angelina Yu. Good afternoon, board members and Dr. McKnight. My name is Angelina Shi, and I'm a sophomore at Richard Montgomery High School. As an MCPS student, today I'm asking you to vote in support of Small Bahana Aluni's resolution for financial literacy education. Last week, one of my senior friends told me that she filled out her entire financial aid application by herself because none of her family members could understand it, even though she herself was struggling with it. It may be shocking, but being a leader of this movement and the Financial Literacy Working Group has taught me that my friend's experience isn't abnormal. In fact, it's the story of almost every student I've talked to. Our math classes don't tell us how to build our credit scores. Our English teachers are too busy going over thesis statements to teach us how to apply for financial aid. 
Our working group's countywide survey found that only 742 students got the chance to take a personal finance course in the last semester. This is out of nearly 45,000 high school students. I can't tell you the number of high schoolers that have attended our town hall meetings or filled out our surveys saying that they are genuinely afraid for their future. They know that what lies ahead of them is something they haven't learned about in the past four years. This innate fear of gaining independence feels like a paradox because why are we so afraid of something that is supposedly freeing, something that our education system has spent years preparing us for? Montgomery County is fundamentally hurting its students when we prepare them to get into colleges and trade schools or go into jobs that they literally cannot afford to pay for. A graduation requirement ensures that before these students permanently leave MCPS, they will be ready to file their tax forms, apply for loans, and be truly financially independent. It's time that we say yes to financial literacy education and follow in the steps of the other Maryland counties that have already implemented this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next is Kara McNulty. Hi, my name is Kara McNulty and I'm the parent of two MCPS students. I continue to be baffled by the administration and board's inability to make forward progress on initiatives announced to address the district's lack of planning for the 2021 school year. For example, test to stay seven weeks ago, exactly 49 days ago today, Ms. Wolf sent a letter to Mr. Elric asking for support for test to stay. We have yet to implement test to stay. I suppose there was a update to the county council this morning. It sounds like it will be started on a very, very limited basis. This is a significant initiative to reduce quarantines and it should be started on a broad basis. We have 50 people on staff. It's time to do test to stay. I also wanna talk about the dashboard, which you launched after the last board meeting and immediately took down because parents identified so many issues with the quality of the data. It was relaunched nine days later and still issues persist. Yesterday and earlier today, the dashboard indicated that no one was on quarantine and there were no positive cases, which is clearly false, and parents continue to identify issues. There's a big issue around credibility, trust, and confidence in your ability to manage this situation. And my last issue I would like to address is the health officer. You have committed to hire a health officer. You posted that role for three days. It was only available for application for three days for such an important role that seems unreasonable. And you do not require that person to have any medical license or certification, which seems like a gap for such an important role during such an important time. And I suggest you reconsider the qualifications for that role. Thank you. Please continue to work on these things to build confidence, trust, and credibility, which you do not have right now. Next is Kelly Speck. Good afternoon, my name is Kelly Speck. Let me tell you about my son who's 14, nonverbal, quadriplegic, and loves his MCPS special school. It's the best. For over 50 weeks, he was home and he was told that virtual school was the best that our county and the teachers unions could offer. So unfortunately for him, he got nothing out of Zoom school for a year. No surprise to me, we now know that Maryland was the 49th state offering in-person instruction, MCPS placing last in the state of Maryland, last of the last. This is sad for so many reasons. The top reasons being that second and fifth graders lost over 35 and 23% respectively in reading. Second graders lost over 20%, while fifth graders lost 25% of their math skills. The kids who suffered the most were black, literacy down 38%, Hispanic literacy down 46%, and those in special ed. This county prides itself on equity and inclusion, so blame falls at our feet as well as the union leaders who irrationally kept kids out of classrooms for over a year and continue to do so with unnecessary quarantines. Instead of a robust plan to make up for the devastating COVID learning losses, MCPS teachers have shared with me information from their trainings, and it's baffling to me to learn the content of these trainings have very little to do with reading, writing, or math. Our kids need better. 
When teachers are, por are forced to participate in over eight hours of race-based training, which includes playing a bingo game entitled Racists in the Comments section, or teachers are accused of racism and alienated with little county support, you're crushing the spirits of our educators. As one teacher told me, I'm counting down the days to retire. The system is breaking me. When my son is wheeled into his classroom, his wheelchair parked next to his friends of all races, his whiteness makes him no different than the other disabled classmates sitting next to him. This is insanity. Perhaps we'd be able to recruit and hire more qualified educators in this county if teachers could avoid the abusive union demands and actually be supported to teach young minds how to think, not what to think. I urge you to stop the intentional division that these staff trainings are creating. You're not unifying. You're dividing our communities based on skin colors of innocent people. How is this benefiting the dire educational needs of the COVID-19 recovery? You. We have your testimony. Next is Don Anarchio Han. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. My name is Dawn Ayanna Kohan. I am a licensed mental health therapist and the mother of two school-age boys. I'm testifying today on the need for MCPS to immediately adopt test to stay and test to return to keep kids in school where they belong. Needlessly quarantining whole classes rather than doing proper contact tracing and testing simply because it's easier must stop. Adopting these programs will drastically decrease the number of kids sent home, the amount of time they must stay home, and will increase their learning time, which will increase academic performance. Our students have undeniably experienced learning loss. This is evidenced by some of the abysmal test scores seen over the last year. But the learning loss goes far beyond academic learning. Social emotional development was also suffering. And in the case of our youngest learners, it has been somewhat stunted. We're seeing increased behavioral issues, mental health problems, physical aggression and fights in some schools. I wonder why. This board kept kids out of school for over a year, thus denying students the social emotional interactions they need. Seeing friends and teachers on a screen is no substitution for the in-person social contact kids need to learn, grow, and be happy. What we're seeing now is kids so overwhelmed by their thoughts and feelings because you had them on Zoom for so long that they're acting out. Kids who never acted out before are getting into physical fights. Kids who were once content and academically motivated are now failing and withdrawn. We're seeing increased self-harm, suicidality, and juvenile crime. Kids have become almost feral. You all literally and figuratively have blood on your hands, and this is a direct result of the protocols currently in place, coupled with how colossally you failed our students last year. Adopt test to stay and test to return. Stop being outliners and playing into the COVID hysteria that's present in this county. And finally, do right by the students you're supposed to serve. It's stop, time to start acting like zero COVID is attainable and let our students get back to normal. The harm you've caused your children is greater than the harm that could befall most if they get COVID. I implore you, move beyond your egos, admit you made poor decisions in the past, and finally start making the right ones so our children can all start to learn and grow again. Thank you. We have your question. Next is David Ziao. Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is David Zhao, and I am a lifelong Montgomery County resident and former MCPS teacher who's concerned about the conflict between the policies on gender identity and parents' rights and the trust parents place in our schools. According to the guidelines for student gender identity in Montgomery County Public Schools, quote, the fact that students disclose their transgender status to staff members or other students does not authorize school staff to disclose student status to others, including parents slash guardians and other school staff members, unless legally required to do so or unless students have authorized such disclosure, end quote. The guidelines further explain, quote, some but not all transgender people take hormones or undergo surgical procedures to change their bodies to align with their gender identity, end quote. Three clarifying questions based on these guidelines. Number one, in MCPS, do parents have the right to know if their child is identifying as transgender at school? Number two, are MCPS employees allowed to truthfully answer when parents ask if their child is identifying as transgender at school? And number three, are MCPS employees allowed to counsel and encourage children to take hormones or undergo surgical procedures to change their bodies without parent permission? Parents trust our public schools to educate their children. This is a sacred trust, and everyday educators in MCPS 
are doing incredible work towards that end. However, the school board mandating that employees lie by omission to parents about their own children violates this trust. I've spoken to many parents and teachers who are very uncomfortable with these policies. Staff, students, and parents deserve answers. If you'd like to connect and you're watching this, you can email me at ideologicalclarity at gmail.com to connect so we can get some answers to these questions. Thank you so much for your time. Next is Julie Saxon. Julie Saxon. Which is the button? First, I would like to thank the board and Dr. McKnight for having me back. My name is Julie Saxon, and I'm the mother of an MCPS student. I'm here today to talk about psychological damage, how falling prey to recent ideals swirling around society is affecting our children and could be damaging considering it's National School Psychology Week. I'm very concerned when I see the following. Here's an excerpt from This Book is Anti-Racist by Tiffany Jewell, which is MCPS fourth grade read reading material, page 129. Quote, if you are white, step aside. You can help other white people step aside. The world is used to hearing voices and stories of white people, close quote. How can the school board say this is not divisive and damaging? Is it okay for white people to be told to step aside? Is it okay for people of color to be told they're oppressed by their friends and classmates? What does this do psychologically? Has anyone researched this? If this is not alarming to every parent of all races, we are in real trouble. These teachings are more damaging than ever before. You are teaching hate. Psychology Weeks talks about let's get in gear. It encourages engaging in best practices and advocating for children's access to mental health and learning supports. What you are doing by putting students in identity groups and MCPS is the antithesis of what a society and school district should be doing. Steps to make students better individuals. Individualism, driving students to dream, not group equity. Equal opportunity and drive to keep trying, not guaranteed outcome. Merit-based achievement, not based on race. Hard work and equal protection to succeed, not skin color defines ability to succeed. Be a good person to yourself and others, not intentional infliction of intergeneration guilt by past history. Treat everyone as equal, not ignoring data and state America is racist. America attracts more minorities than any other country in the world. And again, it needs to be stated, equity does not mean equality. Why all the redactions pertaining to pushback in the PIA from Judicial Watch? Almost 300 pages of redactions. In the PIA, there was a page with the curriculum stated, and that's redacted. Where is the transparency? Thank you. Next is Philip German. President Wolf, members of the board, my name is Philip German, and today I'm representing five communities that border Edson Lane, just north of the Woodward High School site. Our group wants the stadium and the athletic facilities built, but we want it built without destroying a precious county resource that is the Edson Lane Forest. Recently, you received a letter from the WJ Cluster. In it, they champion option one. Their letter contains a number of gross inaccuracies, which if left unchallenged, will be accepted as fact. First, they state that the property was surplused at the request of the county executive. Not true. The property was surplused because MCPS was in dire need of funds. They state that option one will be the most ADA accessible and will have a lower cost requiring fewer retaining walls. Both are not true. They claim that not having, not selecting option one would somehow hinder the girls' athletic programs. Ridiculous. They praise the design of option one because it will only require a portion of the forest, but they don't tell you that the portion is actually 40%. If you were in a terrible auto accident and the doctor said you were going, only going to lose 40% of your arm, <clears throat> In reality, <clears throat> you're losing the functionality of the entire limb. The WJ cluster places no value in the forest. They can't bring themselves to call it a forest. They call it a wooded area, a piece of undeveloped land, 
and county owned area. The Montgomery County Climate Action Plan states that forests need to be preserved and expanded. Shortly, the board will have to decide which option to support and proceed with, balancing the needs of the high school. Thank you, we have your testimony. Thank you. Next is Roby Fields. Hello, my name is Roby Fields. I'm a North Bethesda resident of 19 years, current property owner in Old Georgetown Village and father of two Tilden Middle School students. As a resident in one of the neighborhoods that will be most affected by the Woodward Project, I'm here to voice my support for the project, including full funding of phase two and option 1A as presented by MCPS staff. I do have a few concerns I'd like to share. First is the drainage issue that was noted by our county council. Having seen firsthand the flooded ball field at Tilden, I asked the board not lose focus of this important issue. Second, there have been questions raised in the virtual meetings about the appearance of the large retaining walls. I asked the board to ensure the walls are appealing aesthetically and reduce the chances of them becoming targets of graffiti. In the past year, I know you've received many letters and testimony regarding the Woodward project. Testimony you received previously on behalf of my HOA have ridiculously argued for eliminating the athletic stadium. To be clear, these views do not reflect my views or those of the broader community, and it's the reason I felt compelled to testify today and set the record straight. Given the proximity of our neighborhood, I share many concerns of my fellow residents. However, those who argue for the Edson parcel of trees to remain untouched forever are irrational. Use of this parcel to construct appropriate athletic fields, ensure Title IX accommodations are met, is both reasonable and necessary. The Woodward Project is long overdue, a once in a generation opportunity and our children deserve the best facilities and amenities possible. We cannot afford for this project to be delayed further or obstructed by a small number of residents. There is too much at stake here. Let's build an outstanding school that will serve as a community focal point for years to come. Thank you, and there was additional comments in my written statement. Thank you. Thank you. We received two audio testimonies. First up is Hannah Frank. Please play the audio. Hello, my name is Hannah Frank, and I am a junior at Thomas Wooten High School. I'm asking that you vote to make financial literacy a requirement for high school graduation. The knowledge gained in such a course would not only be highly beneficial, but it, in my opinion, is necessary for all students. I think that required classes should be those that are teaching information that is necessary and helpful to everyone. And what is more essential than knowing the basics of finance? Everyone spends money and needs to understand how to manage their income. High school is supposed to prepare us for life, and in a county with such excellent education, I believe that it is a fundamental oversight to not have a required financial literacy course. As a high school student in MCPS, I have learned about mathematical limits, imaginary numbers, and the in-depth chemical process of photosynthesis, things that will likely have little use to me in my chosen career of public service. But what I have never learned is how to do taxes, nor have I gained an understanding of how to build my credit score. These are valuable skills that I will need in life, as will every other MCPS student. Please decide to enhance our education and better prepare us for our futures by making financial literacy a required course for graduation. Thank you. Next is Matthew Castertano. Please play the audio. Hello, my name is Matthew Casertano, and I am speaking on behalf of Jet Wu, Arya Palan, Contract Shonu, and Emmanuel Odom, the other captains of Montgomery Bird High School's Financial Literacy Club, testifying in favor of a financial literacy graduation requirement. At the surface level, Montgomery County is what every county in America strives for, one of the most diverse, home to four of the nation's ten most diverse cities according to Wallet Hub, and, at the same time, one of the wealthiest, with a median household income over $110,000. 
But if you dig deeper, Montgomery County is a portrait of contrasts. According to the U.S. Census, more than 11% of Black and Hispanic residents, plus more than 16% of residents with less than high school education, live below the federal poverty line. After the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, we noticed a stark reality. The socioeconomic gap had snowballed into something that couldn't be ignored anymore. Reports of people being evicted or living paycheck to paycheck were becoming far more common, affecting our friends, neighbors, and families on a daily basis. Although the county has taken note of this trend and implemented some financial literacy programs, these initiatives have been inconsistent and lackluster. Many of the students in our club don't remember having one, and students who do can point to anything meaningful that they learned and still remember. Our primary goal in starting our club was to improve financial literacy in youth so that we could be better prepared for the future and grow as a community. And we've had some success. We've guided a diverse group of students with finding jobs, opening bank accounts, and starting retirement funds. These students have gained a tremendous amount of hope for their future, hope which has motivated them to work harder academically as well. But as much as we want to help our students, there's still so much we can't do. With a financial literacy graduation requirement, a defined curriculum, and the tools and resources to support students with hand-on learning experiences, we believe that everyone would feel much more confident in their future, best facilitating the growth of students all across the county as they transition into adulthood and financial independence. Thank you. We also received seven video testimonies. First up is Noah Penson. Please play the video. Good afternoon, President Wolf and members of the Board of Education. My name is Noah Pinson. I'm a senior at Quince Orchard High School and an Educational Policy Director on the Montgomery County Regional SGA, commonly known as MCR. Today, I'm here to advocate on behalf of MCR about something that students have long been denied, financial literacy. Frankly, it's unnerving that I'm here in one of the most educated parts of the entire country asking for access to a financial education. Our high schools are teaching students in many advanced, even college level subjects, from thermodynamics to multivariable calculus, but not about money. Financial literacy is one of the most important topics for students to learn, and yet MCPS is denying over 35,000 high school students the right to a financial education. What's even more astounding is that these students want financial literacy. In a survey of over 1,200 MCPS high school students, over 85% supported the expansion of financial literacy to all high schools, and a vast majority said that they'd be interested in taking the course too. Yet only 9.6% of respondents said that they've taken a financial literacy course. Why? Because only five MCPS high schools offer one. Five out of 25 high schools. As one of the most diverse districts in the nation, we have an obligation to educate our students and equip them with what they need for the future. By denying students access to financial literacy, MCPS is inadvertently contributing to the racial and wealth disparities present in the county. Without financial literacy, MCPS simply cannot fulfill its mission of providing students with the skills needed for college and careers. For these reasons, I ask that you listen to your students, the biggest stakeholders, and implement a one semester financial literacy graduation requirement so that all students have exactly what they need to succeed. Thank you. Next is Ruhama Indishaw. Hello, my name is Ruhama Indishaw. I'm a junior at Springbrook High School. I'm speaking before you today as someone who is in favor of the financial literacy graduation requirement. As someone who immigrated to America at a very young age, finances and budgeting have been topics at the center of my life. For years, I remember coming home and having to translate important financial forms and documents to my parents without any idea what I was reading my myself. And this situation is not unique to me, but to hundreds of students in our county. With this experience, I strongly believe financial literacy, especially for our low-income, first-gen and immigrant students, is absolutely essential. If there's one consistent thing students have to say about their classes is how inapplicable they are to their lives, while subjects like math and science are vital to our education, knowing the trends of their periodic table is going to be useless when students are struggling in debt, unaware of how to handle their own finances. When more than one third of our students come from low income families, it is critical that they know how to handle their money wisely. In my time at Springbrook High School, the students I have come in contact with either work a job or are actively looking for one, money to support their families. With the stresses of school, work, and family responsibilities, students simply don't have the time or resources to teach themselves about financial literacy. In a few months, I'll be a senior applying to colleges and preparing to enter the next stages of my life. 
with watching my senior friends having to learn and dissect a whole world of terms, skills, and different choices, I can safely say that there is a deep brewing pot of anxiety for what is before me. For these reasons, I urge you to vote in favor of the financial literacy graduation requirement and take the next steps in, into ensuring the future of success of our students. For this way, no other students will be left alone to learn the skills and concepts that will impact them for years on end. Thank you very much. Next is Noreen Othman. Hello to the Board of Education and others watching. My name is Noreen Othman and I'm a grade nine student attending Northwood High School. I'm a first generation American, meaning both my parents and the people who came before them weren't born citizens in America, they immigrated here. Today, I'd like to specifically tell you about my father. My dad moved to America, relocating Montgomery County when he was 16, turning 17. He enrolled at Montgomery Blair as a ninth grader and after paperwork came in, he was moved up as a junior. My father spoke English and he was smart and he was educated, but it wasn't enough. He wasn't knowledgeable on scholarships, financial aid, and things like how to start a college fund and so much more that would have helped him. He enrolled at Shree University and dropped out the middle of his sophomore year to work. His student debt plus his bills became too much. From a study on educationdata.org, 56% of students at four-year colleges drop out within six years. From the same study, 38% of college dropouts said they left due to financial pressure. My father was and is part of that 38%. If he had learned about financial literacy for moving on to the next stages of his life, he would have progressed farther in post-secondary schooling. To the Board of Education, what I ask of you is to support the resolution of adding a financial literacy course credit to the graduation requirement starting the class of 2028. Not only doing this, but adding a requirement for all high schools in Montgomery County to provide a financial literacy course elective. We cannot claim to have a mission of creating college and career readiness for the students of the county without taking initiative to prevent the experiences that my father had. Trying to see if it would unfreeze. Doesn't look like it. Well, can we play Camilla Shiva? Good afternoon, members of the Board of Education. I'm Camila Shiva, a senior at Winston Churchill High School, and today I will be testifying about making the one-semester personal finance course a requirement for high school graduation. By not offering personal finance as a class in every MCPS high school, MCPS is preventing students from being prepared to transition into the next chapter of their lives, which is becoming financially independent. Too many of us don't feel ready to make life-changing financial decisions once high school ends, leading to heightened uncertainty, anxiety, and a decreased performance in school. Knowing how to file taxes, pay mortgages, and apply for student loans are key to achieving financial stability. These, however, tend to be the subjects that are brushed off the most by schools. I have been fortunate enough to attend one of the five MCPS high schools that offer a personal finance course, and I took it, and I can honestly say that the skills and knowledge that I gained from this experience will definitely last me a lifetime. Not only do I feel better prepared for life after high school, but I am confident in my own ability to make financial decisions. Thus, it is not only enough to simply have a financial literacy course offered, but instead to promote it throughout the county to prepare students for the real world. Introducing personal finance as a one-semester graduation requirement will guarantee that every student in MCPS is financially literate. By equipping students with the tools necessary for college and careers, MCPS will create a new generation of financially educated students. Thank you for your time and consideration. Next is Vaishnavi Banda. Hello, Board of Education members. My name is Vaishan Vibanda, and I'm a sophomore at Pulisville High School. I am here today to testify in support of the Personal Finance Education Resolution. MCPS prides itself on preparing students for college and career. I personally hope to go to college after I graduate, but the cost of college is always going to be a concern in the back of my head. As a first-generation immigrant, my parents have never experienced applying to colleges in America before. Learning how to find scholarships or where to get FAFSA forms from is a task that is going to be placed on me. MCPS cannot expect its students to learn these basic financial needs from their family because that's a luxury many don't have. Many students can't go to college or their preferred college because of the lack of knowledge. Poolsville High School offers a plethora of classes, from vector algebra to ceramics, but it doesn't offer personal finance. Extremely specialized courses like quantum physics may be a great course for someone looking to pursue further education in physics, but personal finance? That's a course that is needed for everyone, regardless of whether or not they're looking to pursue education in a specific pathway. 
Throughout the past year and a half of advocating for personal finance, I have met many students who feel the burden of being unable to afford higher education. One of my peers said, high school classes should be a first glance into the real world, not college. By not offering a personal finance class, MCPS is setting up its students to only learn financial responsibility after they've already made a critical financial mistake. So today, I ask you to help take a crucial step in ensuring college and career readiness by voting in favor of this resolution. Thank you for your time. Next is Mohammed Shazib. Hello, my name is Mohammed Shazib and I'm a student in the Up County area around Clarksburg and the Seneca Valley Clusters and I am here to give a video testimony on why I think MCPS should help the students at Clarksburg or Michigan with the overcrowding because I went there and I could have and Wilson Wimson um Gibbs were closer so I feel like MCPS should like try to like help with that because I feel like Clarksburg or Michigan could get like more overcrowded because it is because I know friends who go there and I feel like MCPS should try to like redistrict students or like maybe build like another elementary school but thanks for listening have a nice rest of your meeting and day our final testimony comes from Laura Vaughn. My name is Laura Vaughn, and I am the mother of two MCPS students. I am here to remind the Board of Education of your mission, to provide leadership and oversight for MCPS. You are the only voice of the community in the administration of our school system. Where have you been? Leadership and oversight require asking tough questions and demanding accountability from MCPS. Here are some questions to start with. Why have we not immediately implemented test to return or test to stay? Test to return requires no school personnel or infrastructure and can shorten quarantine time. Test to stay has been encouraged by Dr. Stoddard and personnel have been hired, so why the delay? Less than 2%, currently 0.2% in LA, of school close contacts test positive for COVID. Test to stay could identify positive cases through daily testing. Why do we still have class-wide quarantines and why is the dashboard still incorrect? The dashboard shows 6,900 children quarantined this year. Given the number of whole class or whole grade quarantines at our school that shows only 33 quarantined students, this number is much lower than the actual number. That's more than 70,000 missed days of school. In our recovery of learning plan, we were promised five days of full-time in-person instruction, yet we still have mass quarantines. What are the aggregate MAP and AP scores in the wake of the past school year? We were assured that we would have a robust virtual experience. This robust experience included only two hours a week of math and English in the secondary schools, and no one on the board questioned whether this was sufficient. We were among the last in the nation to fully open, and now we are beginning to see significant declines in reading and math proficiency. Why is a major part of the learning recovery plan virtual tutoring? MCPS has admitted that virtual learning was subpar. Why then are we relying on virtual tutoring services to mitigate the harms of virtual learning? Where is the urgency in hiring mental health professionals and increasing access for students? We are seeing mental health crises in epidemic proportions. This can't wait. Your SEL program can't fix, fix this. We trusted you to be our voice. Now please demand the accountability and solutions we need. This will conclude our public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education for public comment is Tuesday, November the 9th. Signups for public comment will open the evening of Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021. At this time, I'll ask if anybody on the board would like to say anything. I'm going to, I'm going to start with Miss Aluni. Students showed up today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wrote down the name of everyone, Katie, Angelina, Hana, Matthew, Jet, Arya, Konchak, Emmanuel, Noah, Ruhama, Noreen, Camilla, Vaishnavi, students from eight different high schools showed up to testify either virtually or um, those in person. So thank you so much. I think it speaks volumes that our students, I've always been impressed by them, but our students are starting their own clubs and initiatives to educate their peers and even educate their own family members on how to manage their personal finances. So if that doesn't say something, about um, our educational model and MCPS, I don't know what does. And if this resolution does pass um, when we have our vote, I really hope, you know, I've written down the names of our students here, um, that we can reach back out to them and get some of these students' feedback on what we can do better and what we should be including in a course like this. So 
Thank you to our students. Ms. Harris. Yeah, I totally concur with Ms. O'Looney's comments. Students, um, you really covered the 360 degrees of this issue so very capably, and um, I really do applaud textbook advocacy 101. Um, and I would also like to know if we could get a bit of follow-up on two things. The um, status of the dashboard, I know there are I'm hearing from um, families across the county that still are finding issues with the data quality and also um, the status of our hiring of a health officer. Um, I, I didn't see the job announcement. I would be surprised based on what I heard before the county council if we posted a job description that did not require some form of health background. Um, so can we get a bit of follow up on that as well? Thank you. Ms. Mandrowski, did you have? Did, oh, I thought I saw your light earlier. Um, Dr. McKnight is asked to speak. Yes, thank you so much, President Wolf. And I too wanna thank our students for their comments today. They were very much on time. And I, I, I just wanna say, I'm excited about the fact that we're gonna be digging into financial literacy. Um, I benefited from that as an employee coming into the system, working with a team of teachers who sat down and talked about the importance of starting investment in my first career. Um, as a teacher, and so today I thrive from that, and when I think about the relevance, it truly is uh, important, and it sets the stage for how we can move forward in the future. I do have to shout out a teacher. His name is Mr. Schumann. He works at Quince Orchard High School, and I had the opportunity to sit next to him at a graduation in the spring, and I was so compelled by his speech and his students who spoke of him, and he shared how he'd give them a card at the end of his class or in his class and then that card it would have financial advice and he talked I talked to him I followed up with him because I was so impressed by what he said and he said I think it's an important life skill for them so um, it's time to get to work Mr. Schumann we're going to call you over from Quince Orchard to be a part of the work group to help uh, figure out exactly how we do this along with our students who who just made great cases today in terms of why this is important and so thank you so much for that and I look forward to that work um, that we have been directed to do as a system and that we care about as well. I did want to acknowledge um, uh, the test to stay. I know there was a quick briefing today at the county council about test to stay. And you know we said we absolutely want to do everything that we can to keep our community safe. I also want to say that we have to do this in partnership with other agencies. Our school system, and we talked about the data of our students and how we have to focus on teaching and learning and get back to that. And we really have to depend on a lot of partners to help us navigate through all the needs of COVID-19. And that is no easy task. And so when we started to even talk about what test to stay would look like in Montgomery County, because again, this is a program we would be developing. This is not a program that has been established by the state, which was the case in the state of Massachusetts. Um, we, we came forward and worked with the department, I mean, worked with our county agencies to do that. So in terms of the rollout of it, that very much depends on the staffing that they are able to provide to help support that happening within our school system. Because we are calling on our partners to help us implement those programs because we quite frankly are not staffed and cannot do it. And so I just wanna say that we will continue to work with them. We all would hope that uh, we would be able to work with them and their process would be able to be one that could roll out to serve all of our 209 schools. But we also know we have an issue in the labor market and we have to hire these staff to do this. So at least to start with what we have is a good place to start. And of course, the commitment is to build on that and to work with our partners who are implementing this to build on that. So I just wanted to, to share that with our community just so that you heard that firsthand and got that information uh, from us. So thank you again for your comments. We appreciate it. Is there anyone else? I'm not seeing any other lights, so we'll move to item six. Dr. McKnight, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you again, President Wolf. So our next item um, quite is a resolution and I'd like to begin this resolution by saying, I am personally, and I know I speak for the board in saying this, grateful for the hard work of our staff and what they have shown prior to COVID-19, but what they have really thrived through over the past 18 months. I've had a chance to witness firsthand a lot of our staff going above and beyond, and they are still doing it to make sure that we all can protect the interests of keeping our students in school and safe. Um, and just to share a few examples, I, I think I've seen it all. I've seen our teachers who are able to, on, while we were on virtual learning, use clay 
on the screen to teach students all types of math concepts. I mean, I have seen our teachers be creative with the types of rooms that they build to address social emotional wellness for our students. Again, along with counselors, uh, I've seen our bus drivers provide meals to our community. They are now doing double, triple runs to make sure that our students are getting to school safely and from school safely. Our technology staff still not only giving out Chromebooks, but managing them and making sure that they are still available and ready for our students to utilize. Building services teams, keeping our buildings and facilities clean. Administrators constantly taking on the care of their whole communities. I've seen our principals, assistant principals, take on the very concern that their families share, whether it may be students returning into school or whether it's concern about their social emotional wellness and taking all of that and working with these families through their reservations so that they can thrive. So I just give those examples. I'm sure there are many more that I could share, but I share that because um, I truly reiterate how grateful I am to be a part of a school system where employees are going above and beyond. And as we work through all the things that we are figuring out in this process of how we still navigate through uh, COVID-19, I, I thank them for their service. So with that said, today we bring forth a resolution recommending to improve the cost of living adjustment, step and longevity increases and recruitment and retention incentives for Montgomery County Public School bargaining unit employees. And so I will read our resolves. We resolve that the Board of Education approve the memorandum of understanding between Montgomery County Public Schools, Montgomery County Education Association, service employees and the National Union Local 500, Montgomery County Association of Administrators and Principals regarding jointly negotiated compensation for 21-22 school year and be it further resolved that the Board of Education approve the Montgomery County Education Association supplement to the memorandum of understanding between Montgomery County Public Schools and Montgomery County Association of Administrators and Principals regarding jointly negotiated compensation for the 21 22 school year. Move approval. Second. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Dr. McKnight? Item 7. Do you have, was that 6 1 and 6 2? Yes. That's just okay. combined them. Okay. Uh, let me read the resolve, um, excuse me one second, for 6-2, uh, general wage adjustment for positions not on salary schedule. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Um, I resolve that the Board of Education approve a 1.5% general wage adjustment effective July 1st, 2022 for the positions of uh, executive staff within the district to serve students, including the chief of staff, district-wide services and supports, chief of human resources and development, chief of teaching, learning and schools, chief of uh, strategic initiatives, general counsel, assistant chief of professional learning and development, assistant chief of teaching, learning and schools, and associate superintendents that are on the senior leadership team. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous, thank you. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous, thank you. We're now up to item seven. Dr. McKnight, can I ask you to proceed? Yes, thank you. So, item seven, um, I will ask the team to come forward. Uh, so, item seven provides an update to the board uh, from June 10th. Uh, there was a board resolution that was presented on June 10th around continuous improvement and that, that uh, resolution directed me to review procedures delineated in Montgomery County Public Schools regarding regulation KLA-RA, which is responding to inquiries and complaints from the public to ensure that there are appropriate safeguards for impartial review and evaluation of complaints from the public and to report the findings of the review. So the resolution reflects the board and my commitment to listening to the concerns of our stakeholders and actively engaging them in the process of continuous improvement process to mitigate any institutional barriers that may impact the school system in responding to inquiries and complaints from the public. I know Mr. Peel was here early and he gave a public comment about that. 
And I thank them for those comments uh, because quite frankly, we started the conversation with MCCPTA uh, this past summer around why this was important. And, and uh, I personally say that I recognize and understand the importance of looking at processes that in some ways could possibly send the message that it could be arduous for families to actually make the contact that they need to really solve problems. Um, I recognize the importance of conducting this review. I must say, uh, when I had the opportunity to work in Howard County Public Schools, I worked with a team who had uh, the responsibility to implement a newly revised uh, process that really did deal with uh, complaints from the public. And so we were able to work through that process and I actually saw the value in community feeling like some of their issues were heard in the process that not, did that not make it arduous. So when we started that conversation here in Montgomery County Public Schools, it definitely was one that, that we embraced and uh, thought that it was time for us to do that. So based on this experience and in alignment with the board resolution, I had our MCPS staff consult with our Howard County partners just on that process so that they would be able to learn from them and hear from their perspective and also benchmark with other districts to determine if there were practices, processes, structures, positions, or resources that may provide useful examples of how we could refine this process um, in MCPS procedures and communication strategies to enhance uh, our regulations. So I, I say all of that because I think it's very important that we engage with others, especially when there are processes that are in place in other places that work. My staff also convened a multi-stakeholder group to review and reflect on the process in Regulation KLA-RA for reviewing administrative decisions and resolving disputes. Their review identified focus areas for further review and development. So I am pleased today that we're bringing forward Ms. Stephanie Williams for General Counsel for MCPS and Ms. Sally Davis, Policy Specialist in the Office of the General Counsel, and they're gonna share with you more information about the process for reviewing Regulation KLA-RA the findings identified by the stakeholders who were engaged in this process and the timeline and process for reviewing um, and revising the regulation. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Good morning, good afternoon, Ms. Wolf and board members. Could I ask if we have our slides, please? And we're on slide two. Thank you. Um, so the, as Dr. McKnight mentioned, there was a, there was a stakeholder review team for regulation KLARA, and this team consisted of more than 40 stakeholders representing students, parents, guardians, community members, the employee associations, school-based administrators, and teacher, and, and as well as teachers, board staff, and MCPS central services staff. This stakeholder review team met for four sessions that were held on July 12th, July 23rd, September 20th, and September 28th. The stakeholder review team analyzed each section of the regulation and provided their feedback individually in small groups as well as as part of the entire team's work. They reviewed information from five benchmark school districts to consider if there were practices, processes, structures, positions, or resources that may provide useful examples of refinements um, to our procedures, to the MCPS procedures, as well as communication strategies to enhance um, the implementation and the access to the regulation. The five benchmarked districts were Anne Arundel County Public Schools, Baltimore City Public Schools, the District of Columbia Public Schools, Fairfax County Public Schools, and as Dr. McKnight mentioned, we started with Howard County Public Schools. The next slide, please. So the stakeholder team identified four areas of focus for further consideration. There we go, thank you. The first area addressed adequate safeguards uh, are not in place to support complainants with an understanding and implementation of the f informal and formal processes, which differ based on the type of the complaint. The next area included that MCPS does not have an independent position that serves as an objective resource for complaints, monitors the school system's implementation of the complaint, to the public process, evaluate the complaints or decisions, and identify opportunities for improvement for the process. 
The third uh, observation was that the regulation is complex. So enhanced communication tools and resources, so enhanced communication uh, tools and resources are needed to simplify the multi-step processes. And finally, MCPS does not have a common tracking system to record the inquiries and complaints from the public. At this time, I will ask that Mrs. Davis share the processes and timeline for revising regulation KLRA. And if we could move to the slide four, that would be great. Good afternoon. So the next steps in this process will be to address the findings identified by the stakeholder review team in the following ways. For the remainder of October and through December, a writing team will be convened of MCPS staff responsible for the implementation of KLARA, as well as the new Board of Education ombudsperson. And this group will develop a substantive draft for review by offices with responsibilities related to the implementation of KLARA, for example. The stakeholder review team, as, as Ms. Williams noted, identified the need for user-friendly communication, as was brought up by Mr. Peel earlier. <clears throat> and professional development will be needed on the updated regulations so that there is consistent messaging and implementation regarding the review of administrative decisions and the resolution of disputes. This will take place January and February of 2022. And then the next step will be to organize the workflow so that there is a coordinated rollout of the updated regulation, new communication tools, and professional development on the updated regulation. Revisions and implementation upgrades will be communicated to the Board of Education and the stakeholder review team in the spring of 2022. Thank you. And I will now turn it back to Mrs. Wolf for more discussion. Are, are there any comments? Would anybody like to ask any questions? Ms. Harris? Um, yes, thank you very much for this. I'm very glad this work is being undertaken. I think it is such a huge need and um, something that will help really alleviate a lot of anxiety and stress among our families when they do experience difficulties in our schools. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask, um, one of the four um, decision points or um, findings identified by the stakeholder team is the complexity of the res of regulation, which it absolutely is, and all of the different processes and procedures which differ based on why you are trying to engage with the system. And as I would ask that we consider the writing team contain more than MCPS staff, but also we have a, a, a a large number of community communications experts who are also end users of our system who would be amazing resources, especially as we're developing some kind of a, sim a tool that simplifies the process um, and allows people to see exactly what's the first step depending on what their need is. Um, is that something we could consider? I'm, I'm certain that we could certainly consider ways to bring stakeholders into the process. Yeah, it, there's a lot of expertise out there that I think would enrich the process. And at the very least, make sure we have beta testers, there are end users that are beta testing the products that we're developing, especially students, because we might want, we need them to be able to use these as well. I will add that the group was um, very focused on the communication tool that, that Howard created, and they they really liked that as a communication tool with drop-down menus, and they just found that. So that was a consistent point of discussion. Are there any other questions, comments? Dr. Darka? Yes, I'm just glad that we are going to have a person who is going to be neutral and uh, aware of all of the places in the system that parents can go, because I think just having the board and saying ombudsperson is gonna make a difference for parents because they sometimes don't know who to call, but the ombudsperson will know who's involved and um, and try to work out the complaint so that it, it just doesn't keep going. So um, we congratulate our new person. He was here. <laughs> we're, we're working him to death, Mr. Pat, Fitzpatrick. 
Thank you. Ms. O'Looney. Yeah, really quickly, I just wanted to highlight one of the findings by the stakeholder review team, which is about a common tracking system to record inquiries and complaints. I think that's really, really important, and I want to make sure we don't lose sight of that in this work. Um, making sure that we're taking time to recognize patterns that arise when community members have difficulties accessing central office and different communication platforms. I think recognizing those patterns is what's going to help our system um, improve in our practices. So that's just my quick comment. Thank you. Do you have, you finished? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Silvestri. Yes, um, thank you for this work and look forward to the uh, more finished product in the spring of 2022. Just to reiterate the testing, vetted, testing with the community members that might be the users of this, um, let's remember that many of the parents of our students in this system come from other countries where there isn't a culture of complaint to an educational school system where the word ombudsman doesn't mean anything to them. I think it doesn't mean much to most folks that are maybe not used to having one in their workplace or, so I think the outreach and communication is going to be really important and not just mm -hmm. defining what it is. Um, I, I do this kind of work and mm -hmm. I've, I've had to translate ombuds recently and it was not easy, it was not translatable. You had to explain what it was rather than trying to find a word uh, for what it, uh, what it means. And so just to reiterate the point, make sure that this works for all of our parents and stakeholders, not just for the ones that already know what ombudsman means. Thank you. Are there any other comments? All right, thank you. We're now up to item eight on today's agenda. We will conduct more detailed review of the proposed boundary studies included in the interim superintendent's recommended fiscal year 2023 capital budget and the FY 2023 through 28 capital improvements program. They are supplement A, interim superintendent's recommendation for the Gaithersburg Cluster Elementary School number eight boundary study and supplement B, Interim Superintendent's Recommendation for the Bethesda, Somerset, and Westbrook Elementary Schools Boundary Study. If there are items Dr. McKnight is recommending that board members wish to modify, it would be helpful for affected communities to know about a potential alternative prior to the public meetings. Therefore, I'm suggesting that we identify any alternatives today. If board members wish to identify any alternatives today, they should do so through a motion. If there is a second, a vote will be taken and a brief discussion of the alternative. A majority vote is required in order to place the alternative before the public for comment, along with the sup interim superintendent's recommendation. If the alternative is adopted today by the board, staff will notify the affected communities so they may testify to the interim superintendent's recommendation and the alternative. Please keep in mind that a vote to place an alternative before the board does not commit board members to support the alternative when final action is taken, nor does it preclude the board from making any changes to the CIP when final action is taken. The board is scheduled to take final action on these matters on Thursday, November the 18th, 2021. Dr. McKnight, do you have any comments at this time? I do. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, President Wolf. Um, this item that we are discussing today, as mentioned, is a continuation from our meeting yesterday in which we recommended the fiscal year 23 through 28 capital improvements program, as well as a review of my recommendations for two boundary studies. Yesterday, we presented my recommendations for the Gaithersburg Cluster Elementary School number eight boundary study, as well as for the Bethesda Somerset and Westbrook Elementary Schools boundary study. The staff is prepared today to answer any questions regarding those two boundary studies and respond to questions that were raised yesterday 
during the work session. We look forward to our work with you during the coming weeks to prepare the final request for the review of the county council and the county executive. I know that we've gone through a number of iterations over weeks to bring forward to you what we bought yesterday and hopefully you've had some time to really think about that. I know that we've heard from a number of stakeholders. I know I have, I know you have uh, since our presentation yesterday. So that should set us up to have some really robust discussion today if there are any thoughts about it. So I'd just again like to thank the staff, Mrs. Carmijas, Adrian and uh, Seth Adams uh, for the work that they do and uh, Jeannie Dawson. Uh, for being a part of just all of the creative options that we thought could bring forward uh, to our community while sharing the interest of what we've learned about uh, things that we should consider, particularly in our boundary studies. So if it's okay, Ms. Wolf, yes, we will be ahead. ready to jump in. And so I'll hand it over to Ms. Jeannie Dawson, the Chief of Finance and Operations, and the staff in the Department of Facilities Management uh, to provide this presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we are excited to be back and we are going to highlight again uh, the boundary scope, enrollment projections and guiding parameters as well as some stakeholder input, uh, options, development, and finally um, the interim <coughs> superintendent's recommendation. We'll also provide uh, some responses to questions that occurred yesterday and we look forward to your input, uh, feedback, and any other alternatives. So with that, we will get started with Adrian and Seth. Good afternoon. So um, we have today the presentation basically that we uh, showed you all yesterday for the two boundary studies. Um, we can start with the Gaithersburg Cluster Elementary School. I know that we do have some follow-up. There were some questions. Mrs. Wolf, you asked a few questions regarding the Sum Bethesda, Somerset, and Westbrook, and we can, um, we can review those once we get to Supplement B. I just figured that we would start with Supplement A, see if there are any additional questions. We can go through any slides that you're interested if you have questions on, um, and then we can just go right to B if there are no other questions for A. Uh, please continue. So no questions for A. So if we could... Oh, hold on, oh. Ms. Aluni has a question. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on something that uh, Ms. Silvestre mentioned yesterday, which was about um, why the scope of the boundary studies were so constrained and why we weren't looking at um, schools that are in other clusters. And I know that you mentioned the Watkins Mill study that will be happening in the future, um, but I don't think we ever got a direct response to why we can't incorporate some other schools now before looking, you know, six or seven years down the road. So um, if, if we can move to slide, and I may not have the exact slide. Um, if, if you can move ahead to the slides, there's a map. Um, maybe we can look at the map, but I could start answering you as, as they, that's good. We can start from here. So, um, so first, let me say that when we are doing um, capital projects and boundaries are linked to capital projects, many times we are focused on the area, the specific area that is being, in this case, overutilized, uh, and as a result, having that capital project. So for example, for Gaithersburg number eight, we, um, the recommendation was to open a new elementary school to address the overutilization at all of the elementary schools within the cluster. Um, at the time when we started looking at this, which is probably four or five years ago at least, um, almost all of the schools, probably with the exception of the two, Laytonsville and Goshen, were overutilized. And so all of those schools actually made up an elementary school's worth of um, capacity. Um, and that is actually today when we look at the recommendation, they, each of those elementary schools are within the 90% for the most part. And so um, having that association, having those schools that are going to feed into that elementary school and that capital project specifically for those elementary schools is, is one of the reasons why we didn't sort of expand it. Um, and that happens with, with certain projects. Um, the second boundary study is similar to that, right? Somerset, Bethesda, and Westbrook are specifically just looking at Somerset and Bethesda to go to Westbrook, and the relief is at Westbrook. Um, do you wanna? It, it, yeah, and I would just add also that the, uh, as, as Adrian said, you know, this particular project, there's, there's actually pretty deep history in this when it started out as a capacity study uh, for the Gaithersburg cluster. 
uh, probably back in the 2012, 2013 timeframe. Um, you know, the, the history of this one is we, we started, we went through and did a capacity study of each of the schools in the cluster, um, which obviously included both, both uh, Goshen and Laytonsville. Um, and then ultimately uh, came to the conclusion that we, we should build a new school. Um, following that discussion, though, there was um, strong advocacy from Gaithersburg Elementary and a few of the other surrounding schools um, that really uh, came out in strong support of saying, we are a walking community, we want to stay a walking community. And at that time, we actually pivoted to looking at Gaithersburg Elementary and building that to uh, a, a, a 1,000 or 1,100, 1,200 elementary sized elementary school. Subsequent to some more conversations, uh, it was determined a, an elementary school of that size was just not in the best interest of, of the community. It was not in the best interest of delivering program. And you know, then the decision was ultimately to take a step back, you know, really focus on the site selection from, from the perspective of allowing you know, the community to remain um, a walking community for the most part. And, and obviously we've, we've ended up from a Kelly Park uh, site selection process to, to ultimately this, this boundary discussion. So while I think you know, the question around incorporating other clusters is a very good, good question and one that we strive for in, in almost all boundaries, this particular boundary does have a history with, with strong advocacy from uh, residents trying to remain a walking community. And I think, as Adrian said, the capacities of these schools and the overutilization of these schools actually allows this to be a boundary to maximize walkers and, and to really do it in a way that's, that's within the community versus take it much broader. Um, so, so again, from, from the perspective of it being a capital project and, and from the history of, of uh, the advocacy here, it just makes sense to look at this from, from the zones that, uh, that where you started with and, and looking at it from the perspective of maximizing walkers. Yeah, uh, I, I hear you and I understand that capacity is an important consideration and transportation is as well, but it's not our only consideration, right? We look at the board policy and we have demographics and diversity on there for a reason. And I think, I mean, this comment was made yesterday. We're looking at a very limited and a very homogenous group of schools. So there's not much playing around that we can do. But if we expand to, you know, I see Brown Station in that area, Carson, College Gardens that I believe feed into Quince Orchard and Richard Montgomery. Um, I think that there's a lot more that we could do with this. But that's just my two cents. And, and, and a very valid point, and I, th I think one, too, when you think about populating a new school, um, you, you do look at the, the adjacent schools that are overutilized. And, and I think if, if we had a case here where you had a few schools that were underutilized and then adjacent further over in some of the other clusters were overutilized, you could think about maybe starting to, to domino students in um, in order to to balance the overutilization piece here, but 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 again, when when you do look at some of these schools, you look at the surrounding area. Uh, there's there's not much room at, at any of the schools in this this vicinity. So thinking about moving kids out, as Adrian presented yesterday, that are walkers, to move them to adjacent clusters and then bring kids over is, is sometimes a, a difficult decision, but but one that. Uh, was not necessarily part of this recommendation. But I would say, though, we, we had a really good opportunity to do a bus tour of this area. And when you, one of the things that really um, was highlighted in this second phase, thinking about Watkins Mill, Gaithersburg, North, per se, and Magruder, is the fact that when you're at the corner of, of, uh, of Goshen Road and, and Warfield Road, right near Goshen Elementary School, South Lake Elementary um, service area is directly next door to that. So when you start to think about what that second phase could look like, you do have the opportunity then to start broadening further out um, into the Watkins Mill cluster, further possibly into the QO, all the way over into the Magruder cluster. But when you do look at those schools, you see that some are over, over capacity, some are under, and you have the ability to really um, work with the surrounding clusters to, to, to find some of that demographic balance, but also capacity balance while you're doing that. Oops. Thank you. Um, could we just get some data on the utilization and demographics of the surrounding elementary schools that are not part of the Gaithersburg cluster, looking at Magruder, Watkins Mill, Quince Orchard, um, whatever else 
is in this area, that would be very helpful so we can see what it actually looks like. Dr. D Dr. Daka. Yeah, I just wanted to say I do remember you talking about looking at schools in the Magruder area, so I know that you're thinking about that, but thank you. Ms. Silvestri. Um, so we didn't get any emails about this uh, boundary analysis or the study, so you mentioned, I just wondered what the community feedback was. You did extensive outreach, and you've described that in the slides here, but Anything that we need to know? You said walkability was a high priority. Anything else that uh, you remember that you can share with the board? So um, I, what immediately comes to mind is the Sabre community. Um, they certainly um, voice their support for having uh, the students, their students in the community, be able to walk to the elementary school as well as walk to the middle school and have their middle school, their students in the Sabre community go to Forest Oak, which was a change, would have been a change, which actually is included in the superintendent's recommendation. Um, we did hear a lot about geography as we hear, you know, having a school that's sort of close to home. In those focus meetings that we had, those focus group meetings, which were the smaller meetings, we did hear um, uh, support for schools that, have, that are diverse. So there's certainly what we heard about diversity, the importance of diversity and the importance of uh, geography, walkability and being able to uh, be able to go to the school, which was one of the things that we raised about Laytonsville and Goshen, having families be able to pick up their child at school, attend a PTA event or a, P, uh, a school event was also, and that is also sort of part of geography. So those were the two main things that we did here. And these, um, I think, just to make sure I'm understanding it, when they say diverse, they mean we don't want it to be 90% of one group. Um, we want to have different so, groups. So I don't want to interpret you know, what we heard, but when we talk about diversity, we talk about having schools that are um, have different populations. And when we had those conversations about diversity, which is one of the factors that we look at, um, they the community's shared support for that factor. Thank you. Ms. Mandrowski. Yeah, thank you. I um, appreciate the background information from before. It's been a, it's been a while. I remember it well. Um, and, you know, in the uh, meetings that we had back then, it was, as you mentioned, very strongly um, expressed that the walkability and not losing um, the, the wraparound services, if you will, were very important to the community, which is why we consider doing the um, increase, like just doing an addition to Gaithersburg Elementary. Um, I did happen to see um, the mayor of Gaithersburg and some of the city council members who mentioned that they are very supportive of this. They, I said, you should come and testify, but <laughs> because we haven't heard from any people, but they said that they've heard from a lot of people at the. Uh, at the polling sites as well. So um, just because you mentioned that we hadn't heard anything. So, um, but um, I, I thank you for your work and your time on this. I know um, that these are um, difficult decisions to make. Um, to me, this is one community that, because they've expressed how important the access to the school is, um, I feel like this this does a good job of um, making sure that we have the most walkable situation possible. Um, and I know that that was really important, as you mentioned, to the Sabre community as well. So thank you for working around all of this stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Evans, did you want to say something? Uh, nothing different than what my colleagues have already said. And um, Mr. Adams did mention that the bus, the, the board members did do a, um, a bus tour, right? And so that really helped us a lot because prior to that tour, um, while Ms. Silvestri mentioned that we hadn't gotten the emails, we were getting flooded, and they were coming and giving public comments and coming to the hearings and everything. And so the fact that we haven't um, had anything, I've, I've not heard anything negative from anyone as well, um, that we took a lot of things into consideration. And so I am, I don't have any questions other than to say um, thank you 
for working on this. Um, as it was stated earlier, it's never easy to do this work, but um, we always ask and you always um, look at our policy and take the factors into consideration. So thank you. I have to say that I, I agree. Uh, I remember that walkability was the most important factor and we wanna be very careful that we don't disenfranchise our parents from being able to access a school by moving them to an area that they have no ability to get to. Uh, we have to remember that a lot of parents, particularly over in that area, are you know impacted by certain factors that don't allow them to be able to have a car and make it easy to get to places. So I, I, I think this works and as Ms. Silvestri said, we haven't heard any negativity on this, so that's a plus. Thank you. You want to carry on with your other one? I don't know if anyone, does anyone have any questions about Bethesda Chevy Chase Somerset, or do you need them to do the presentation first? Well, if we can go actually to those slides, it'll start on supplement B. I do have some answers to the follow-up questions, okay. and maybe that will sort of lead off additional questions if you have. So if we can move to those slides. One more, please. Let's see where we are. Yes, so the next slide, please. So yesterday, Mrs. Wolf, you asked some questions. I think that there were some questions about uh, the data that we used um, for the boundary study. So if you look at the top, um, box, that's the 2021-2022 school year. So this school year, this information, that top box is in our CIP, the CIP that was just released last week. The bottom box is th what was uh, part of the superintendent's recommendation. So you can see those differences in um, the, the demographics. There aren't, it, it isn't a lot. There are some that are, that are uh, different by um, a few percentage points. But overall, especially looking at the farms percentage data, um, is, is um, and you can only look at the farms, the, the top box of the farms is, is the 2021-2022 school year. We do not have yet 2021-2022 farms and ESOL data. That comes towards the end of the year. So that is the most recent data. The bottom box with the farms and ESOL is based on that 2021-2022 data based upon the superintendent's recommendation. So it is the late, we used just this past year's information and the superintendent, when that recommendation was released, used this year's September 20th data and the slides that we showed, and we can go on in, in the slides, but the slides that we showed yesterday was actually the this school year preliminary September 30th. So it is all up to date uh, enrollment information and demographic racial ethnic um, data information. The second question that you asked was about our meetings. So this was our meeting schedule. Started in January with our public information meetings. Then we had our first round of options in February, the beginning of February, we had our second round of options towards the end of February into March. And then we had our last set of public information meetings at middle of March. Um, we, we didn't uh, count the number of people that attended, but clearly when we were in the Zoom, it was anywhere between 30 and 50 people that attended each of the meetings. The last set of meetings always have a little less because it's already done, the options are presented, and really it's just a review of what went on uh, in the previous meetings. But I would say anywhere between 30 and 50 people attended each of those meetings. Next slide, please. Um, you also asked about survey information. So this is the survey information that, is, that was um, included in the superintendent's report that was released in, I think the report was released in June. So for the first survey, uh, there were 349 people that responded, and you can see one of the questions that we ask is basically, who are you? Um, to help us just have a sense, and you can answer uh, more than one time. You could be a, a, you know, a, an employee and a parent. Um, and so um, they won't always add up to the number of respondents. 
But you can see there the number, so about 183 people responded from Bethesda, 59 from Somerset, and 67 from Westbrook. And then you can see the other and the parents and so on. Next slide, please. So the factors, we know we have the four factors, and this is asking what's most important, somewhat, and least important. And I know that we've shown this survey information before, so you could see, for example, most important, geography is the, is the bar in blue. So I think it's 246 people, uh, respondents said that geography was the most important, and then you can see somewhat and least important, uh, stability of school assignment, um, came in somewhere in uh, the somewhat important, utilization came in in each of them, the highest actually and least important, um, and then the demographic characteristics, also the most in the least important. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the first set of options. Remember, we had two rounds of options. The first was five, and then it was four. So you could see uh, the results, um, which was preferred, one, two, and three, based upon the options. So for example, option one, there were 87 people who preferred it. Uh, I, I'm sorry, for option one, um, it, it's their, their choice, first, second, and third. So you could see that the blue for 87, uh, it was 19 for second, and then uh, for third choice, 54 people for option one. That's how you read it. It's first, second, and third choice for each of the options that are there. Uh, next slide, please. This is round two survey because we had a second round of options, so we always do a second round of survey. Uh, 310 people responded to this one. Again, you can see uh, the vast majority of them were parents, but you could also see where they um, broke up per school. 156 of them from Bethesda, 33 from Somerset, and 71 from Westbrook. Again, they won't all add up to 310. Next slide, please. So again, the factors, uh, geography again is the most important factor and you can see that, that um, different bars and the different results to somewhat and least important. Next slide. And the options, and here it's all nine options. So our second survey provides all nine options. And again, you can see based upon options one through five, what was the first preferred, second, and third preferred? Okay, next slide, please. And so that, those were the questions uh, asked of yesterday regarding this boundary study. And then we can answer any other questions anybody may have. Are there any questions, Ms. Sylvester? So given that there seems to be uh, support for option four, could you explain to us um, what that option, why that option was not the recommended option of the superintendent? Sure. So I'm just going to explain it a little bit. And if, if you could move the slides, I believe it's the last slide or the second to last slide. And then it's actually up on, there's a summary I provided yesterday, a summary. Uh, next slide, please. Let's see. Oh, right here. Okay. So in the summary, first we see um, options two, four, and five were not recommended because they did not address the utilization factor for Bethesda as well as option one. What slide is this? This is slide 52. And so I will, and, and the information that I'm going to provide you is from um, the, the enrollment that we had, that we used, which was the 2020-2021 school year, the same enrollment that we used um, for, for the study as a whole. So when we, when we look at that, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at Gaithersburg. I knew that didn't look right. Hold on one second. So just 2020, 2021 was our COVID year, so. Right, so it was, and it was just this past, it wasn't this past September, of course, it was the September before, because of course we did the boundary study in the winter time. So it was taken directly from our CIP, and you know, if 
what we would do is if there was an alternative put on the table, what we would provide for you is the updated enrollment information from this September, the same way it was done for the superintendent's recommendation. So option four, And in the last analysis, you gave us the data of enrollment for each school, but did you give us the enrollment for each school for this? No, so, so we have the superintendent's recommendation, and that's the updated enrollment information. In the superintendent's report, which is what I'm looking at, the packet supplement B, it has the, all of the options, and it would have the enrollment information, but the enrollment information from the 2020-21 school year which is the, the enrollment information that we used for the boundary study as a whole. So, so just to summarize that point, so the, the, the report is using the same set of information to look at all options together. What, what was uh, submitted as part of the superintendent's recommendation uses the most current information we have uh, from, from utilization and, and enrollment. So, so as Adrian said, if alternatives are put on the table, we will go back and update whatever alternative, whatever process to reflect the most current information. But what Adrian's going to read to you right now is from the report, which was looking at all schools from the same information was last year's uh, enrollment information. So hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, but you know, again, the report information is look, uses the exact same information, which is last year's enrollment. The superintendent's recommendation uses the most current school year information because we want to provide you obviously with the most current information as part of the superintendent's recommendation. But again, if you, if you were to say uh, an alternative would like, you would like to pursue or look at an alternative such as option four, we'll go back, run the numbers and bring that back to you with the most current information. I guess my question is, I understand this is 2020-21 data, but did enrollment go down at these schools this year, that, that year across all three schools? So actually no. So um, the enrollment for September 30th for Bethesda actually went up a little bit, very little, um, but, and for Somerset and Westbrook, they both went down. Um, and I would have to know the exact numbers, and I don't because what's in the CIP is the superintendent's recommendation, which is based upon her, um, the, the boundary recommendation that she chose. So I would have to let you know, um, but I do know that Bethesda went up a little bit over the six-year period, and both Somerset and Westbrook went down over the six-year period. And Adrian, one yes. thing I'd like to say, Mrs. Carmihars, is we can bring those numbers back in terms of the enrollment if there is an interest in looking at how much the enrollment went down in those two particular schools, if that'll be helpful. I will say in our discussions and in planning, we actually took a look at schools where there was a decrease in enrollment and tried to think about what would be appropriate scenario if we saw enrollment increase in those spaces, knowing that this year has been different because of COVID-19 with current enrollment numbers. So we, we did have lots of conversation about that. And I can, what I can do now, I'll go through just, and I'm only gonna give you the last year of the CIP, you know, so just you have that one number. So for example, for option four, Bethesda would stay at 119% overutilized, about 104 students. So if you think about their numbers have grown slightly, that will be a slight increase over that 119. Um, in option four, Somerset would be at 87% utilized, 66 students. So assume that would be a little bit, they'd have a little bit more room. Um, and uh, Westbrook is at 85% uh, utilized, 91 seats. So again, assume that number, there would be more room than 91 seats based upon their, their new enrollment numbers. Um, and, and so when looking at this, um, option four, as stated also um, on the slide, is that it did not address the overutilization at Bethesda. You're talking about over 100 students still remaining at Bethesda. Um, and the superintendent's recommendation leaves, I believe it was 31 students um, overutilized. Um, so, that, that was one of the main reasons um, for, that, for the recommendation as opposed to option four. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions, comments? 
I was just going to say, um, Ms. Karen Mihas, can you just do me the favor? We're just going to make the assumption that everybody that is viewing today did not look at our work session yesterday, although it was very entertaining and very enlightening. Can you just go back and talk about when we first started this, what was the initial reason? It was because there was overcrowding but Bethesda Elementary, going to the Westbrook, and just can you just do that briefly? Some, some history, absolutely. So actually this started uh, in the full CIP, last full CIP. The Board of Education put in an addition at Bethesda Elementary School and an addition at Westbrook Elementary School. Um, the addition at Bethesda Elementary School was to relieve the overutilization at Bethesda and the addition at Westbrook Elementary School was to relieve the overutilization at Somerset. Um, there also was at the same time a recommendation to do a boundary study between, between Somerset and Westbrook Elementary School. And that boundary study actually went forth. Um, and in the fall, so this wasn't this past fall, the fall before, um, the superintendent actually recommended not going forward with that boundary study in addition, also not going forward with the Bethesda Elementary School addition project, that was about $16.5 million. And instead, and, and we were having fiscal constraints as we continue to in the county, instead the recommendation was to allocate a portion of that $16.5 million, it was about $4.4 million, from the Bethesda Elementary School addition project to Westbrook to fit out because the Westbrook Elementary School edition was not approved by the County Council in that prior CIP. And so the recommendation was to not do the Bethesda Elementary School edition project, reallocate a portion of those funds to the Westbrook Shell build out. And the recommendation on the boundary side was to sort of set aside the boundary study between Somerset and Westbrook and instead recommend a new boundary study to address the um, overutilization at Bethesda and Somerset to re be relieved by Westbrook. And part of that was, um, as Ms. Olini, Looney talked about, you know, looking at other, other issues, other adjacencies, Westbrook had available capacity even prior to um, that recommendation. And so to be able to take advantage of that, um, that, utiliz that available seats and then put on the shell build out on top of that, if we added up the two overutilizations from both Somerset and, and Bethesda, we were able to address the overutilization at one school, which was Westbrook. And so that's why the change, um, not going ahead with Bethesda Elementary School Edition, going ahead with the Westbrook shell build out and then doing the boundary study between the three schools to really address the Bethesda um, overutilization as well as Somerset. Somerset wasn't nearly as overutilized. It actually almost was at capacity. The concern, and we talked about this yesterday, is that Somerset is on the second smallest site in the county, elementary school site in the county. And so putting relocatables there would be extremely difficult. So uh, giving them some room um, during this boundary study, what was one of the other reasons um, that they were, of course, part of the boundary study. So that's sort of where we were. That's why we uh, did the set, almost like a second boundary study and included all three of those schools. Any other questions or comments? I, I just have a um, clarification question or procedure clarification. So if we don't if we want to say look at one of the other options like number four we have to do that today right. otherwise it's not considered it at all is that correct and you have to get a majority. right I, I was just clarifying because i think there was discussion about whether or not they were still all in play so, so there's there's more opportunity so so today would allow for um the, the testimony and the public hearings, obviously, to reflect all the options that are on the table. Uh, currently, it's it's only the superintendent's recommendation. If, if alternatives were put on the table either today or on Thursday at that work session, uh, then that becomes part of the uh, um, you know the discussion points at those public hearings. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Thank you. I uh, just, I think, more a comment than anything. Um, I do appreciate the way that this study in particular is embracing some of the, one of the things that we've been talking about for quite some time, which is 
finding non-CIP solutions to capacity challenges. And I think, you know, we are, we are in a difficult time right now with, you know, we've seen enrollment drop, and we're also seeing construction costs going way up. You know, COVID effects on both, but I think it's much more reasonable to assume the COVID impacts on enrollment will, will work out and our enrollment will again move forward and increase as we've been projecting, whereas the fiscal challenges we face with increases in labor costs and increase in materials costs may well be with us to stay, which makes it even more important than we, anytime we can, and this gets not so much in this study, gets to something Ms. Aluni was talking about earlier, we have to be very open in looking not just at um, non-CIP solutions to capacity challenges in a cluster, but also looking at adjacency. And you know, we can see um, overcapacity schools relatively near undercapacity schools throughout the county. And I hope we see more of this kind of really creative and innovative work um, so that we can make sure, you know, school all of our students are in safe and adequate facilities. Um, while we manage our funds as responsibly as we can. So I really do appreciate this work um, from that, through that lens particularly. Ms. Aluni. Yeah, just as a follow-up, I'd love to get some information about um, the surrounding elementary schools and their demographic data for this study as well. Thank you. All right, is there, are there any more questions? Ms. Silvestri? So, just so that I'm clear, and understanding the community engagement implications of what we decide today. So we're saying that if we don't put forward another alternative, one through eight, nine, nine. nine. <laughs> what does that mean? If we do not put forward any other recommendation, what does that mean and how does that interact with the public testimony that we're going to be hearing in the next couple of days? So, so typically what the uh, community, what you will hear in public testimony, if there is only the superintendent's recommendation on the table and no alternatives, is people coming out either supporting the superintendent's recommendation or not supporting the superintendent's recommendation. If an alternative is put on the table, then the community can testify either in support or not support of the superintendent's recommendation or in support or not in support of whatever alternative the board put on the table. Um, what Seth was alluding to before too is that if you're going to put um, an alternative on the table as Ms. Wolf indicated, um, they ha the community has to have an opportunity to testify um, for or against that alternative and that was why we're saying that if, if it's put on today or even by Thursday, testimony then starts the following week, they have the opportunity. Of course, you wanna give notice to the community as well to say, hey, the board member, the board has put alternative um, option X on the table for them to, be, to have the opportunity to testify as well. That's why the earlier you put an alternative on the table, if that's what you're going to do, the better, just to, for us to be able to inform the community so that they could testify. But if no alternatives are, are, are then put on the table, it is either supporting the superintendents or not supporting the superintendents. Of course, people can testify and, and say whatever, you know, they, they can add, but that is the point. It's but either I one first. then or the other. Yeah, I just hope that the community understands that process well. So we, well, we have, and in, in, in when we do our boundary study, we have multiple slides that talk about the process, including the alternatives and the opportunity that it is the superintendent's recommendation that is on the table, that board members can um, put alternatives on the table, and then it would be the superintendents and the board during, during public hearing. We also relay to the community that just because board members put an alternative on the table, it does not mean in the end that that's what would be uh, approved by the board as Ms. Wolf indicated. So we do, we, we do, we have that in our slides, in our presentation, of course, you know, for people who attend the meetings um, to try to have them understand the process. Okay, thank you. I'm not seeing any more light, so I wanna thank you for the presentation and answering the questions. See you on Thursday.
<laughs> All right, we are a little bit ahead of schedule, so I am going to take privilege here and go to item 10 before we break. Okay. Oh, st okay, the staff was told 535, 6.15, so we will go into recess for 30 minutes. Will 30 minutes give them time to get here? 30 minutes. So we will return at, well, let's say we'll return at 5 o'clock. Thank you.
Thank you, President Wolf. Today you're going to spend some time in this section of our agenda to hear more details about how our schools and offices have been working to mitigate learning disruption, a topic that we have been discussing uh, since we have been faced with the pandemic and discovering all of the challenges that go along with that. Um, and just to name a few, we're going to talk a little bit today about the review of the summer school programming. I know we've had a lot of discussion about that, but today we're going to talk about what we've learned from our summer school program and implications for the future. We're going to examine the impact of summer programming. Also, with that said, we're going to think about what are the recommendations we're considering right now that we want to plan for uh, in getting prepared for summer of 2022. We're going to also examine fall academic trends. We said that we would come back to the board uh, and share more updated information about our student academic progress, so we will do so today. And then most importantly, in response to that data that we look at today, we're going to have a discussion really focusing on the instructional response to the performance data that we take a look at today. I remind you, the performance data that we looked at the last time uh, was from the spring. Now we're able to look at the uh, performance data from students uh, who were able to test in more normal conditions this year as we brought them back into our schools. Last year included virtual and hybrid learning, which was extremely difficult for both our students and staff. We quickly came to the realization that students would need extra time and support with their teachers to maintain their pace and to be ready to learn for the school year. We worked hard to offer the largest and most comprehensive summer program. We've talked about the success of that, the recruitment, and then how our community uh, came out and enrolled their students in the program. And we're so happy that they took advantage of that because I do believe that did prepare our students in many ways for returning to school in the fall. We ultimately served more than 53,000 students at all levels which required more than 6,100 support staff and teachers. There were programs available in every school for any student. This work showed truly that when challenged, MCPS was able to meet the need. We had the technology in place, the systems and support to be able to provide our students with meals, even for those students who were served, being served in the virtual uh, environment. And we also made transportation happen. Now I will say, with that, although we, make it, we made it happen as we normally do, there were challenges. Recruiting staff was a significant challenge, and we understood why. It was a very tough year over the past year, and sometimes summer represents the time to take a break and recalibrate. But even with that challenge, I'm proud to say that many stepped up and did everything they could to provide the needs of our students, and we were able to successfully host our summer school program. So today we're going to hear more details about that work and the impact it's had on our students. Did it work for our kids? I'll say yes, it did, to bring them back into some normal circumstances this summer, to get them reacclimated to in-person learning, supporting uh, areas of reading and mathematics, uh, mathematics and literacy uh, was really important. But we're today going to hear more specific results from surveys in which respondents gave high praise for the work and students reported learning new skills that the summer school uh, provided that they found beneficial to their learning. And I highlight that because we've been having conversations about data, and I think it's important for us to always bring data that speaks to where our students are academically, but the perception data is also important. And so I highlight the fact that the survey provides us an opportunity to look at how our students feel as the recipients of a service, how our staff feel as those who are providing the service so that we can continue to look at ways to uh, determine what works well in our systems and areas uh, for improvement. 
We fully intend to offer a robust program. Yet again, we are still growing back from the pandemic, and so that's had a significant uh, impact on our student learning, and we're being very astute to that, and we'll continue to collect data to figure out how we form that program. And finally, we're gonna hear a staff report on trends in learning from this fall. It is early, but we're looking at that data and some of the key areas of work that we're gonna uh, talk about that really relate to how we're being responsive to that data is examination of the school improvement plan. We talked about that at some of our previous board meetings. That continues to be the focus on how schools will look at exactly what the needs are, the learning needs are for their students and social emotional needs within their schools and address that. Important training for teacher leaders with the focus on their ability to support teachers to tailor instruction to meet student needs. And most importantly, ensuring equity in all instructional approaches so that the instructional approaches actually do are and are designed to meet the needs of every individual student. So this is gonna be an exciting presentation, I'll say. <laughs> I'm so proud of the work that we've done to identify the priorities and the planning methods that we're putting in place to support our students and staff and the work that everyone's done to make this a true priority because this is our priority and I continue to say that this is one that has to keep our focus as we uh, settle back into our um, educational space. So thank you to um, Ms. Rubin and the team in the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools. We'll now hear from Mr. Scott Murphy, the Director of College and Career Readiness and District-wide Programs in the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools. Scott, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. McKnight, and good evening. Um, again, I served as one of the co-leads of the summer programming, but I just wanted to mention that I certainly stand alongside so many of my colleagues who work together, as Dr. McKnight said, to make it happen. As you know, over the spring and summer, we reported to you a few times with updates about the planning and implementation of what was an unprecedented summer program last year. Tonight, we're gonna to examine some data regarding the impact of those programs, but before we do that, we wanted to provide a quick review of the design, the scale, and some of the lessons learned from the programs that took place last summer. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As you may remember, when planning for summer programs began, we need to go to the next slide, please. One more. Thank you. When planning for the summer programs began last winter and into the spring, we were still in virtual instruction and were beginning the phase in of in-person reopening. As a result, the design of the summer programs was to prioritize in-person summer instruction in local schools to address the learning disruption and continue the return to in-person instruction for more and more students. To that end, each local school offered an in-person program to their students, staffed by local school staff to the greatest extent possible. These in-person offerings also included the traditional Extended Learning Opportunity, or ELO program in Title I schools, and the pre-pandemic program known as Summer Up. In some clusters, schools partnered in one facility to create staffing efficiencies or as a result of facility projects that were underway. For elementary and middle schools, programs were focused on math and literacy curriculum with specials and enrichment matched to student interest. At the high school level, local high schools offered a combination of courses for original credit, repeat credit, credit recovery, and for enrichment. Also, for the first time, we offered a centralized all virtual program for students in rising kindergarten through grade eight so that families who preferred to remain virtual had that option. The curriculum and instructional hours of the all virtual program mirrored the in-person programs. This also included a virtual option for ELO. <clears throat> Another important priority was the traditional extended school year or ESY program for students with disabilities serving students in various locations throughout the district. Also, the traditional centralized high school program offered credit-bearing online courses to keep students on track for graduation, and for the first time, offering courses in career and technical education. All of these programs were offered at no cost to students, funded through what is known as ESSER funding, provided through the federal government as part of COVID relief. Next slide, please. Across these various programs, this is the baseline enrollment as of July, over 50,000 students, an all-time record for summer programming. This is about triple what would be a normal summer before the pandemic. Wanted to note that at the high school level, these are shown as course enrollments. Uh, some students do take more than one course. On the right is the enrollment broken down by student group and services, which as you can see, reflects the demographics and diversity of our district as a whole. 
Next slide. With the unprecedented scale of these programs, it did not come without challenges, but we worked across every office in MCPS and took innovative steps to address these challenges. As Dr. McKnight mentioned, one of the greatest challenges was staffing. Although many surrounding districts were forced to downsize or cancel parts of their summer programming, MCPS worked aggressively throughout the spring and early summer to fully staff our programs. Ultimately, over 4,400 teachers and 1,700 supporting service professionals answered the call and served our students this past summer. New hiring strategies included a summer supplemental premium pay for all teacher and support staff serving the summer programs, leveraging our substitute teacher and paraeducator workforce, allowing new hires to begin service in the summer, and hiring available non-MCPS educators. We also, for the first time, created standardized summer bell times at each level so that we could maximize transportation resources with a smaller summer staff and serve all students who needed transportation. With programs at this scale, we learned that we are often competing with ourselves when hiring or staffing programs, so next year we will need to be intentional about prioritizing programs that serve students with the greatest need, such as ESY. It may, be, it may in fact be difficult, difficult to find a summer workforce of this scale every year. But for students who registered within the established timelines, which went from April into early June, no student was turned away. We would also like to recognize the MCPS operations team, especially those who uh, ensured that students had transportation to their local school, that breakfast and lunch was provided, that school health rooms were covered, and that our facilities were ready. There were also other critical functions supported by other offices, such as technology and innovation, communications, human resources, and others. We also partnered with county agencies to provide wraparound services before and after the MCPS program to provide additional support to families. Looking ahead, in a few minutes, we will share initial recommendations for summer 2022. But first, we will examine some data regarding the impact of last year's program and some suggested improvements. I will now turn it over to Dr. Keisha Addison for that part of the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Murphy, and good evening, members of the board. In this next section, next slide please, I will share what we learned from examining pre and post assessments as well as feedback from various stakeholder groups that allows us to understand the impact of summer programs offered this past summer. Next slide please. This slide details information on the percentages of students who participated in the various summer programming opportunities. I would like to point out that you will see two bars at the elementary level as we intentionally organize the data to show results for primary and intermediate levels, um, connecting to our September 21st presentation on evidence of learning. For gender, which is on the left-hand side of the slide, we see that there were more males who participated than females, 53.8% compared to 46.2%. To the right side, you see the participation across the service groups by level for elementary, middle, and high school. 41.5% of primary level students and 39.4% of intermediate level students were indicated as receiving free and reduced price meal services or farms. At the middle school level, 28.2% of middle school participants were identified as receiving farm services and 27.2% of high school participants were identified as receiving farm services. You will notice that there were higher percentages of students identified as receiving special education services across all levels. Percentages were over 50% at the elementary level, in the mid 40s at the middle school level, and low 40s at the high school level. Next slide, please. Here you see the attendance rates by school level and grade. Our analysis reveals high attendance rates across the levels with the overall attendance rate for all students at 92.3%. Attendance rates at the elementary level was the lowest compared to secondary participants with 86.2% for students in primary grades, grades kindergarten through grade two, and 87.1% for students in elementary intermediate grade levels, grades three through five. Next slide, please. <clears throat> One approach to examining the impact of summer programming on students is to examine their performance on pre and post assessments administered at the start and end of the summer program. 
To conduct this analysis, we ensured students had both pre and post assessment scores. Here we present math performance results for students who are in grades two through eight. The visual on the left provides a quick way for you to see the pre-assessment mean score in dark gray or black and the post-test assessment scores in blue. Visually, you can see that across grades two through eight, there were improvements. However, we also conducted analysis to determine whether what we are seeing visually is statistically significant. And as you can see on the right side, yes, it was statistically significant and differences observed in math were presented. The bar chart on the right details mean percentage point change from pre-test to post-test. Next slide, please. Continuing with the results for math, the differences for students receiving farms and special education services and students identified as limited English proficient or LEP are presented. Similar to what was found and shared on the previous slide, statistically significant differences in math performance were observed for students in all service groups as well as when disaggregated by student focus groups. Next slide, please. Now we transition to analysis of literacy results at the elementary level as measured by pre and post assessments. Again, on the left side, you can see the differences between mean pre-test scores compared to post-test scores. The results were statistically significant across all grades, grades one through five, with improvement ranging from 6.2 percentage point increase at grade one to 10.3 percentage points at grade four. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Transitioning to literacy, pre and post assessment results for students at the middle school level. On the left, we can see the difference between the pre and post test scores. It is important to note that these assessments were on a scale ranging from 500 to 1500, which aligns to what is indicated on the visual to the left. Based on the analysis, Statistically significant differences in literacy performance were observed for grades six and eight. And although not statistically significant, there was a slight increase from pre and post assessment scores for students in grade seven. Next slide, please. Continuing with results for literacy, the differences for students receiving farms and special education services and students identified as limited English proficient or LEP are presented for elementary on the left and middle school on the right. These data show that the performance of students varied by student focus groups within the school level. The mean percentages for LEP and students receiving farms and students at the elementary level increased by 9.6 and 9.5 percentage points respectively. At the middle school level, there were slight decreases in post-test scores relative to the pre-test scores for students receiving services. Results for some of the student focus groups in the middle reveal increases in post-test scores. Next slide, please. Now we'll transition to feedback obtained from students and families, teachers, and school-based administrators. Surveys were emailed to individuals with the survey remaining open between September 11th through October 1st. The student survey was only sent to students in grades six through 12 who participated in summer school. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this slide provides details on the distribution of summer school surveys. The top row shows you how many surveys were sent to each stakeholder group, and the bottom two rows show the number of responses from each group and associated response rate. Looking at the top row, we see that slightly more than 22,000 surveys were sent to middle and high school students. 31,149 surveys were sent to parents or guardians of elementary, middle, and high school students who participated in summer school. 3,672 surveys were sent to teachers across all levels who served in a summer school program, and 503 school-based administrators received surveys. For students and parents, there was a 6.7% and a 9.2% response rate, respectively. With our response rates for these groups, we recognize our opportunity and our need to increase our reach to obtain more feedback from these student groups. For school staff, the response rate was higher with a 40.3% response rate, and for administrators, there was a 32.6% response rate. The bar graphs at the bottom of the slide detail the percentage of respondents by school level with the highest percentage of response 
with the highest percentage of responses being from stakeholders at the elementary level. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this slide provides an overall summary of survey responses by five broad areas that respondents were asked to answer survey questions about. You can see the five areas on the left-hand side of the slide. You will notice a grade for each area by stakeholder group. This grade was awarded based on the number in the parentheses just under each grade, which is the mean score based on a four-point scale. For example, for the area of instruction, curriculum, and learning experience, the average response score for students was 3.2, as shown in the parentheses. The 3.2 was derived by averaging the participants' responses across all survey items they answered for this area. After the mean score is calculated, it was converted to a grade. You can think about it similar to how value points are awarded for letter grades. Continuing with our example, if you look over at the grading scale on the bottom right hand of the slide, you'll find that a score of 3.2 corresponds to a B plus for the area of instruction, curriculum, and learning experience. Looking across the various topics, we observe stakeholder, stakeholder ratings of a B or higher across all areas and groups. And we also see that stakeholders were similar to each other in their ratings. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 1,466 students responded to the survey. Looking at the graph on the left, we see what students thought overall as a whole, which is the gray percentage, as well as by middle school, which is the orange percentage, and high school level, which is the green percentage, on skills they learned or strengthened during summer school. Just over half cited problem solving, which is in the gray dot that indicates 54%, and time management, the gray dot that indicates 51%, as areas they learned or strengthened. Other areas with high percentages were critical thinking at 47% and communication, 42%. Fewer students cited collaboration as an area with 27% overall. Also, we see with the green and orange dots, there were some variation in answers depending on the respondent's level of school. In particular, for the skill, the skill of collaboration, the difference between middle and high school was 36 percentage points. Other areas with large differences between middle and high school respondents were communication and time management. Shifting to the right side of the slide, we see results related to student perceptions of whether summer school was beneficial to their learning. And thinking about what we just reported and looking at the gray box on the right, the answer is yes. 54% felt they learned or strengthened their problem solving skills and 47% their critical thinking skills. And in the area of social emotional benefits, 89% reported summer school program provided them a positive learning environment and 66% reported they learned strategies to build positive relationships and collaboration. Next slide, please. Close to 3,000 parents or guardians responded to the survey. 79% of all responding individuals were satisfied with their child's summer school experience. As the bars underneath detail, a higher percentage of elementary parents were satisfied compared to the middle and high school respondents. Respondents were also asked to rank their top five expectations for their child's experience in summer school. The top right-hand side of the slide details their responses. The number one expectation they had for this experience was to prepare their child for the next grade level, followed by giving them an engaging learning environment for the next, sorry, learning environment, giving them opportunities to engage with students, finishing learning from last year, and then other expectations, such as getting their child used to a routine after a year full of virtual learning and acclimating their child to a new school. Not all parents or guardians wrote in what they meant when they selected other. And as the last graphic shows on the bottom right, 77% of all responding parents cited the summer school program met their expectations which is a good indicator of program quality. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 1,478 teachers responded to the survey. Looking at the top left-hand side of the slide, we see the top strategies teachers use to encourage students to enroll. 
44% reported talking with students, 43% talking with parents, 41% reported sending out information, and 37% reported collaborating with administrative and instructional staff. There was a difference by level, although not shown here. Elementary teachers were more likely to talk to parents and secondary teachers were more likely to talk to students. Underneath that, we see that 86% of teachers indicated they were interested in teaching summer school again, and 85% of teachers agreed their class was successful in helping students catch up on their learning from the 2020-2021 school year and getting them ready for fall. If we look at the right-hand side of the slide, we see the ratings for communication and support were high from teachers. 85% said expectations were clearly communicated, 92% reported their administrators were responsive, 74% said, said support from central office was adequate, and 78% said the curriculum aligned to their students' needs. Next slide, please. 164 administrators responded to the survey, and looking at the data on the top left-hand side of the slide, we see administrators were very actively encouraging students to enroll in summer school. Almost all responding administrators reported sending out information to parents or guardians. 87% talked to parents and 79% collaborated with instructional staff. A very high percentage of responding administrators reported receiving safety supplies and instructional supplies, 90% and 81% respectively. 64% said they received adequate support from the central office team. And looking at the top right-hand side, we see noted as an area of improvement that 50% wanted improved coordination with central office. Administrators also provided suggestions for improvement from a list of possible options where they could select all that applied. The areas that received the highest percentage of responses are listed on the bottom right, 51% reported that hiring more teachers, and 36% reported that streamline, streamlining the hiring process would help. This was followed by 36% reporting that priorita prioritizing students with learning needs for participation would help. Next slide, please. Each group was asked to provide suggestions for improvement. This slide provides a summary of what was reported. Looking at the two quadrants on the top of the grid, we can see the top responses from students and parents and guardians. For students, they cited improving instruction and content of classes, increasing content and scheduling options like more credit courses and more electives, and also improving communication about assignments, grades, feedback, and schedules. For parents and guardians, they would like to see an increase in scheduling options. Like students, they like to they would like for there to be an increase in the types of content offered. And finally, parents also noted that improving communication would also help to improve the summer school experience. Looking at the two quadrants on the bottom of the grid, we can see the top responses by teachers and administrators. For teachers, they cited they would like earlier hiring, and one reason often reported was so that they can make their summer plans. They needed materials and time to prepare for lessons, and they also noted the need for more planning time. For administrators, they also would like to see more efficient hiring processes, as well as more teachers hired. They would like improved coordination with central office. And finally, they'd like even more communication with parents. I will now turn it back over to Mr. Murphy, who will share preliminary recommendations for summer 2022. Thank you, Dr. Addison. Next slide, please. So based on this data review, the suggestions for improvement, the ongoing urgency of mitigating learning disruption, we are committed to again providing robust summer programs for students at all levels in summer 2022. Although we will be working closely with stakeholders and our mitigating learning disruption committee in planning for next summer, here's a framework with initial recommendations for next year. Next slide. These priorities and recommendations include continuing to offer in-person programs at no cost to students with transportation provided, a more intentional data-driven focus on students with the greatest need to maximize staffing resources and meet students' needs, prioritizing traditional programs for Title I schools, the ELO program, and for students with disabilities, the ESY program, as well as what will be compensatory and recovery services. 
We would like to maintain an all virtual program for rising kindergarten through grade eight as we did last summer for the first time and continue to expand the high school online blended courses in place of the traditional regional summer school. I also wanted to note that we've made structural changes internally to include a dedicated position to support planning and implementation of summer programs, which should improve some of the central office coordination and support to schools. As these plans for summer 2022 are developed with our committee and our stakeholders, differentiation by level will likely be called for, resulting in some differences between elementary, middle, and high school. This concludes this part of the presentation, and we now turn it back to you, Ms. Wolf, for discussion. Thank you. Do I see any comments right now? Ms. O'Looney? Yes, I have a few different comments. The first, I just want to thank you all for the amount of time I know it took to collect this data and present it in such a comprehensive and an easily understandable way. I know I always talk about qualitative data being really important to improve our programming, and I think this is a great example of the feedback that we should continue to be uh, soliciting from our community and our students. So I thank you for that. Um, one thing that caught my eye was <clears throat> survey key findings from students um, and the difference between middle school and high school students when they talked about um, strengthening skills, um, whether it was problem solving, communication, collaboration, time management. Um, we see consistently that the middle school numbers are, are higher than the high school ones, and I think that's really telling, um, considering that middle school is often a time when students are building those kind of skills. You know, they have to be independently managing their own classes. They don't have one teacher in charge of everything they do all the time. Um, so I think it's really telling that after a year of virtual learning, middle school students, much more than high school students, felt that the summer school experience, some of which was in person, um, really helped them strengthen their skills. And I wonder for the students who weren't able to participate um, in a summer enrichment opportunity, um, I just think this is really important feedback to take into consideration. You know, this, these are skills that students clearly missed out on um, in virtual learning. They weren't able to gain and obtain. So just feedback to keep in mind for not summer school, but as we go through the rest of the year. Um, and then just one uh, piece of feedback I got from students and community members that I wanted to share with you all about summer school. Uh, disparities in elective course offerings and enrichment opportunities based on uh, the high school or the middle school that uh, they attend. Um, I think that's something that we should be looking at, especially now that we have this new virtual platform. It shouldn't be that you're restricted uh, in the opportunities you can take over the summer based on what school you're restricted to go to. Um, so looking into expanding different elective opportunities virtually. Um, and then maybe even allowing students to take courses that aren't um, at their home school, right? If they have the transportation or can find a way to get themselves there with the ride on, um, I think that would be a good thing to look into. Thank you. Just a moment, uh, Ms. Holuni, I wanna thank you for, for those comments. We're actually gonna talk a little bit about that in our presentation on Thursday. Um, you did actually set up for a nice preview when we talk about uh, innovation opportunities that we're using in our ESSER uh, funding and one you speak to which is transforming our next level of work around digital opportunities for students. So I just wanted to add that that's one that we're already looking at in another space and we'll begin to talk a little bit about that on Thursday. Ms. Harris. Yes, yeah, thank you for this. A um, couple of questions. Do we have broken down or can we get um, the numbers of students that took which particular classes? Um, kind of building on what Ms. O'Looney was saying in, in some schools, um, hearings didn't have the ro as robust an array of, of uh, electives and classes. Um, but I think it would be helpful to us to see overall what classes did students take, especially when some of the survey results were asking for uh, more flexibility in scheduling so they could take more classes, and they also clearly had some suggestions about other classes they'd like to see. Um, and then um, a question, in one of the slides you talked about, you defined participation um, as having attended at least one day of summer school. 
And then we, when you talked about attendance writ large, and I'm wondering about the number of students who completed whatever course it was that they, that they registered for. On slide nine, your attendance data, is that a proxy for completion of the course for which they registered? No, not in this sense. It was just clearly just the attendance. It wasn't a proxy in terms of whether they completed that course. So that's something we can look into. Yeah, I would like to see um, the number of students who uh, actually completed the course that they that they signed up for. Um, and then the other question I had for this part um, is on slide 14, when there were a couple of groups, and there's a little dis di kind of um, explanatory language in there, but the um, students whose literacy performance actually dipped. Um, and there's a note in there that the assessment that was used was given sooner um, than is recommended. Um, just wondering, is that the explanation that, you know, their in-school performance assessment dropped from their initial pre-assessment? Which slide is that? Uh, it's on slide number 14. Yeah, that certainly stood out to us too as we analyzed this. This is certainly an anomaly we're looking into. Um, the exact path is an external uh, platform that we use for the very first time. Um, and we may not have used it exactly as designed by the third party. So this is an area that we are following up on and we'll get back to you on what we find out. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to take a liberty here and ask one question. On the survey respondent breakdown, slide number 17, I, I was curious, most of the time the answers were pretty consistent, but the administrators and the teachers here seem to have a real difference of opinion about instruction, curriculum, and learning experience. What exactly were you measuring in that? I mean, what were you looking for? It probably would be easier if we share the survey so you could see the different items that were included in that section so we can do that so that you can kind of. I think that would be helpful for me. And I also want to associate myself with the comments of Ms. O'Looney because everyone knows that I've been <laughs> harboring for virtual programming so that our students, particularly our students in East County, can access more opportunities. Ms. Sylvester. Could you uh, restate or remind me what assessments um, this data is based on? I mean, we just talked about this one um, that Ms. Harris pointed out, but is that, was that, that wasn't for everyone, right? No. At the elementary level, we used um, our, di our curriculum assessments. So, that are aligned to our literacy and mathematics curriculum. They have pre and post assessments. And then um, the exact path was used for our middle school, high school. The high school courses were also using a third party platform, the Adminum uh, online courses, which have assessments built into them. So depending on the grade level, depending on the content area, um, the assessments that were used were, were either in, developed in-house, were used uh, aligned to the curriculum, as Ms. Hazel said, or in the example of high school, were the external platform. Okay. Uh, Dr. Addison, on, pay, on slide 12, um, we talk about sig statistically significant, 12 and 13. Which, um, well, s slide 13. Which ones, or how are you denoting what's statistically significant? So on this slide, all of them were. Um, so across, wait, is that slide? Oh, Let's do 13, yeah. Oh, um, so for this one, sorry, grade six and eight were statistically significant, and so, but not grade seven, although there was a slight increase. And how would we know that that's true? It is in the gray box. Um, so it says, based on the pre and post assessments, statistically significant differences in literacy in grades six and eight were observed. Okay. And what do we think is happening in grade seven that, that was not significant? I will turn that over to one of you. They aren't, they aren't new to the school. They're in between. But that's the case for all of them, right? No, sixth grade, they're just coming into middle school. 
Yeah, we're, yeah, we're looking into good. that again, uh, a, different, a, a different type of assessment, but we're still looking into what might have happened at the middle school level with our special populations and with grade seven. And then on slide 10, grade four students started out really low, 28.8. Um, and they made significant gains, 15.4 increases. But why were they so low to begin with? I'm reminded that we do have our supervisors in our virtual audience. If uh, our elementary supervisor, Ms. Malika Brown, is available to respond to this question. Oh, this is mathematics, excuse me, Sheila Berlinger. Um, may be able to respond to this question around the grade four pre-assessment data. Sheila, are you available? Or can you hear? Uh, of course. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for including me. Um, and um, so when we've taken a look at the pre-assessment data, it's important to understand that the content that we were using for summer instruction was content that was not included during the school year because we'd been compressing and omitting content in order to work within the schedule that we would provided in the school year last year. So there's no surprise that pre-assessment data would be at a particularly low level um, moving forward because it should be information that is new to all students. I'm bringing the slide back up so that I can take a look at it as well. Thank you. Grade four. Yeah, so when we were, um, so yes, we, we know that so much of the learning is predicated on the, the coherence of the curriculum used in elementary mathematics is, is, um, is aligned and has been um, evaluated as such. And so we know that there had been um, a series of learning that the students had not been exposed to in their previous two years of mathematics. So it is no surprise that our pretest scores are going to be fairly low. And we are pleased that we did see the growth um, that we did see by the end of the module and the instruction in the summer. It's these kinds of numbers that are driving the work we're doing with our foundational learning this year as we're helping teachers build back that foundation that students may have missed coming into grade uh, coming into the next grade of instruction. Yeah, it's just, if, if that were the case, then you would see really low pre-tests for second grade and third grade, and you don't see that. I'm just... There is a, there's, a, there's just a transition in the learning when you're going um, from the standards in grades K and one, and the standards in grades two and three as you're moving towards grade four. I'd have to revisit the module of instruction that was selected for grade four, and I'm happy to do so and provide you some more detailed information about the learning that preceded coming into the summer instruction, and I can certainly provide that to you all in writing as well. Okay, just I think this is what we're trying to do this school year, right, is uh, move the needle on the, the learning loss, and so I think it's really important that we understand our data and the patterns and, you know, why we see anomalies and what we're going to do about it, so thank you. Dr. Daka. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate how you put this together so it's really understandable, very clear, uh, very concise, and you've covered so much. Uh, you and your staff, Dr. Addison, have covered so many items in here, and we, I really appreciate your report. And um, it's always in the back of my mind, how many kids do we have that are LEP, farms, um, special ed, and black or brown? in the same person. I don't know. That might make a difference in how we're looking at calculating. Um, I'm really so thrilled that so many kids did take part in summer school. And I think the hybrid really helps and we should go forward with that because we've got a lot of kids that just can't get around um, and may have jobs and can only do uh, a certain amount of time uh, working on the courses. And I'm I'm also uh, really pleased that they, some of them did so well in summer school because there is research out there that says that students who 
or anybody who has a large chunk of education at one time and they're not diverted by other courses actually learn more and retain more. So I hope that's what's happening here. Thank you. Ms. O'Looney. Yes, me again, sorry. Um, I just wanted to quickly add on to Ms. Wolf's comments about um, expanding virtual options as sort of a goal to strive for in summer of 2022. I think not only will that help increase accessibility and also equity issues across our district that we see with summer school programming, um, I also think it's really beneficial for our students to be able to expand their peer groups, to be able to you know, uh, socialize, interact, learn with students who don't go to their school. Um, I think that will be a real benefit to our students to be able to interact and learn in that kind of environment. Ms. Harris. Yeah, thank you. One, one more thing. Um, I, I am, I think, struck a bit by, uh, on slide 24, the um, priorities, the summer 22, so looking ahead, um, initial recommendations and priorities, they don't seem to include um, some of the key takeaways from uh, our boots on the ground, the teachers and the administrators, um, which was to provide the teachers earlier access to materials and more planning time. And then the administrators were, you know, improving that coordination with central office. And I think that is so essential because teachers can't plan and deliver robust and engaging lessons if they don't have the time to prepare those lessons. And, and we all know that um, student engagement and achievement is directly related to the instruction they receive. So um, I think if we could include in priorities, you know, really listening to what the teachers had to tell us about getting those materials early and in a timely way so they have the opportunity and also to work with their PLCs to, to create lessons so they're not swimming alone. And then um, that central office coordination for administrators, I think, should also be prioritized. Thanks. Ms. Silvestri. Um, yeah, two questions. Uh, the first is, do you see any differences between students that participated online versus those that participated in person, in particular for the elementary school grades? I didn't see any data uh, disaggregated there. And my second question, oh, okay, let's, let's do that one. First. Oh, um, sorry. We did not examine that, so we can look into that to see if there are differences between those who are in person versus virtual. I think that'll be important for next summer. Um, and then do we know if the students that needed the most support and acceleration actually participated in summer school? Or is that what's captured in the feedback that says, uh, slide 21, prioritize students with learning needs for participation in the program. So do we know if we reached the population that we wanted to reach as much as we could, or is there room for improvement there? Um, so we do have information on the students who were recommended for summer school, which was based on academic criteria and the extent to which they showed up for summer school. And so we can um, get that information to you after this meeting so that you kind of see that information. And I, I to add to that, that um, our principals and other administrators um, did a significant outreach to families, um, inviting them to participate in summer school based on the data, um, data that they received not only from central office, but their own um, looking at the, their classroom, their report card grades, and other external data um, to reach out to the families to participate. Am I seeing any more comments or questions? Thank you. You, you can continue. Next slide, please. Thank you. So similar to last school year, we are sharing data on the performance of students as measured by the measures of academic progress or MAP assessment. The MAP assessment is a single measure that is used to allow us to have a data point on the performance of students at the beginning of the school year. In this portion of the presentation, data will be presented by school levels, elementary primary grades, elementary intermediate grades, middle school and high school only grades nine and 10. For each level, you will see three data visuals, one for all students, one for students in the focus groups, 
and one for students receiving services. Data for this fall will be compared to performance from fall 2020, last fall. Next slide, please. What you see here is a trend of the performance of elementary primary level students on the fall administration of MAP Mathematics or MAP M. Overall, 62% of primary level students who took the assessment this fall met the 50th national percentile, our proxy for being on grade level. And examining differences by focus groups for the two years, notice there is a decrease for all groups with the largest decreases observed for Hispanic Latino students not receiving farms, Hispanic Latino students receiving farms, and black or African American students not receiving farms. Next slide, please. For elementary intermediate level students on the fall administration of math mathematics, we see similar results. Overall, 52.1% of intermediate level students who took the assessment this fall met the 50th national percentile. And examining differences for students receiving services, we see differences ranging from 4.3 percentage points for students receiving special education services to 8.2 percentage points for students identified as limited English proficient. There are decreases for all groups with the smallest differences observed for Asian, white, and all of the student groups not receiving farms. Next slide, please. Shifting to the middle school level for mathematics, overall 53.6% of students who took the assessment this fall met the 50th national percentile or higher. And examining differences by the focus groups, decreases in the percentage of students meeting the 50th national percentile is observed for all groups. Next slide, please. For grades nine and 10 high school students, 58.4% were at or above the 50th national percentile. Similar differences of, as observed at the elementary and middle school levels are revealed. And examining differences by the focus groups and service groups Notice there are decreases for all groups with the largest decreases, largest differences observed for students receiving farms and Hispanic Latino students not receiving farms. Next slide, please. Transitioning to literacy, we see that 75% of elementary primary level students on the fall administration of map reading fluency met or exceeded grade level expectations. For students in the focus groups, decreases are observed for all groups with the smallest difference observed for Asian, white, and all other students not receiving farms. Next slide, please. Uh, can you go back a slide? Slides are missing. Okay. Um, go to the next slide, please. Um, for students in grades 9 and 10, 70.7% were at or above the 50th national percentile. Decreases for students in the focus groups range from 2.0 percentage points for Asian, white, and all other students not receiving farms to 7.1 percentage points for black or African American students not receiving farms. Next slide, please. For elementary intermediate level students on the fall administration of MAP reading, 60.6% were at or above the 50th national percentile. Here we see differences between last fall are much smaller than that for primary students. And examining differences for students receiving services, we see differences ranging from 2.6 percentage points for students receiving special education services to 4.1 percentage points for students identified as limited English proficient. Next slide, please. At the middle school level for MAP R, 66.7% of students who took the assessment this fall were at or above the 50th national percentile. Again, although there are decreases observed, there are, they are much smaller than those observed in mathematics. Next slide, please. I will now turn it over to Ms. Hazel, who will share our instructional response to the data. All right, well, good 
Good afternoon, good evening. Um, I just want to start by uh, saying that we are uh, encouraged by the summer data, and we did see increases in student performance based on the time they were there. However, we do recognize, um, based on the fall map data from last school year to this school year, there are decreases in student performance, and we expect to see gains throughout the year as we continue. If you can go to the next slide, please. We just want to remind you that our goal is for students to be at or above a grade level this school year as we move throughout the year. And the last month uh, that we were here with you, we shared our six areas of focus as it related to mitigating learning disruptions, and they're on your left-hand side of the screen. I'm just going to go through a few areas and just provide you with some updates at this time. Starting with school improvement planning, uh, we heard from Mr. Kutsos and his team last month around their efforts around school improvement planning. And uh, this plan does call for schools to be accountable and to consistently monitor the academic progress of their students, also monitoring the social and emotional well-being and development of students along the way. And through the guidance of the Office of School Support and Improvement, schools are analyzing their evidence of learning data to identify the students who were most impacted by the pandemic. And they are working to develop plans that will build the capacity of their teachers to serve students and also serve families. Um, and they're also developing um, professional development plans um, that will really dig into uh, the needs of students based on data. I did want to share with you the, that the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools hosted school improvement drop-in meetings last week. And the drop-in sessions provided clarity for our principals and other school leaders about using data to develop action steps and provide school teams with the opportunity to exchange ideas with one another and resources with one another. We had all of our units in the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools there, along with our equity unit, to support our school-based staff. And one of the things that I think is really important for us to just be reminded of is that our school improvement plans, all of the goals for all schools this year is to get our students back to those grade level or above standards. And so uh, really working on how they will accelerate student learning to meet those needs to get them back on track to grade level expectations. I also want to share with you that the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs has been leading professional development for our school leaders. And the focus really is digging into the curriculum implementation. Again, we are beginning year three of implementation. For some schools, this is their first year doing it in, built, in the school building in person. So we are really trying to build their capacity to tailor their instruction to meet the needs of a variety of learners. Our English learners uh, are a, a large population of students that we are really supporting um, as we are providing professional development to our teachers to ensure that our ESOL teachers and our general education teachers are partnering around, partnering around how to provide instruction for our English learners. We are also focusing on our students with limited or interrupted education, uh, or SLIFE students, and how we support them in the school building as well. Also, as you saw from the data, our students who have IEPs, um, individual education plans, also um, sh showed a decline in the data. And so we have partnered with our special education team to also provide professional development for teachers as well. We also wanted to share with you that in addition to what we are doing here in central office, we've been partnering with consultants outside of the school district to support 
many of our um, schools. And so we have different programs taking place. You heard about the Lavinia project uh, with East Silver Spring that we've now expanded to about 10 other schools. Um, we've also partnered with the Support Ed. You heard about that in previous meetings around ESOL support. We've expanded that partnership and also Science of Reading uh, pilot building the capacity of our teachers around um, our foundational skills. So all of these types of um, external partnerships that we have with consultants are really helping us grow as a district to really think about what we need to learn and then how we might grow that out to other schools in the future. They have been working with us doing classroom observations. They've been really uh, looking at what's happening in our classrooms to provide a needs assessment for our schools. They have really been working with us on coaching, refining our instructional strategies, and our schools are developing really strong professional learning communities. Next slide, please. I also wanted to just share with you some updates around tutoring and address some of the questions that we've been receiving, and then I will follow that with some updates on interventions. I want us to, um, if we can think about tutoring as a boost for our students whose grades might have slipped during the pandemic, uh, if we look at students who maybe showed a slight decline in our MAP scores or students who lost engagement during the pandemic and our uh, staff was noting that, those are the types of students that we want to be involved in our tutoring program. And schools are, are working now to identify those students. Um, so we want the tutoring to be an opportunity to accelerate the learning for our students and get them back on track and close to grade level as possible. This, uh, at this time, we are going to begin our tutoring virtually. We recognize that in-person instruction is the most ideal. However, given where we are right now um, and given what schools are dealing with, we felt that virtual instruction was the um, most efficient way to get this up and running. And we have seen that when we do virtual instruction with anywhere from one to five students in very small groups, it can be very effective. Our hope is that as we move into the later parts of the school year, we will begin to do face-to-face, -face, but that of course requires more coordination, finding spaces, feeding students, providing transportation and all of those things. So we wanted to just be able to get started now and then we will move to face-to-face -to -face as we move throughout the school year. At this time, we have hired uh, 124 lead teachers. There will be one lead teacher in every school. And we also have hired about 130 teachers and or paraeducators as tutors. And um, they are really working now. Some schools have already started tutoring. Others are still trying to identify the staff to get it moving in their school buildings. And so we're working very closely with schools to just get a sense of where they are. Um, we just want to remind you that students will be identified for tutoring through multiple data points, report card data. We will use our curriculum assessments. That's what we call those district assessments through evidence of learning and also map assessments. And so those will be used to determine which students are, are most appropriate for tutoring. Also, our MCPS literacy and mathematics curriculum will be used as the resource for teaching students um, the curriculum during the tutoring sessions. We also want to share that um, as we are tracking the performance of students, we will be using our Performance Matters data system. We will track the students, how they were doing. Um, we will use um, pre and post assessment data to monitor how the students are doing. And we will also compare how students do in tutoring compared to those who are not in tutoring. So as we come back to you, we'll, we'll be able to share those updates. I also wanted to just share with you that we are, um, we will have external vendors as well. So we have been in the process of interviewing. We had 26 candidates. We interviewed um, three uh, 
individuals or, or vendor partners that were interested in uh, our tutoring program. And so the interviews were conducted. We will bring to you next month our recommendation for your approval. And while I can't share who we are interested in having as our tutoring um, external partners, I do want to say that we want to use those partners to assist with tutoring before and after school. And um, for those schools in particular that are really struggling to find staff, we would use our external partners there. And um, we also are looking into the possibility of external partners for those families who may not be selected or students who may not be selected for tutoring, that they could reach out and um, use those tutoring services as well. So we want to make sure that we are providing something for everyone through our tutoring partners. And we'll be able to share a little bit more with you next month for approval. Next slide, please. In terms of our interventions, uh, again, intervention services are provided for our students who have more intensive needs than those students who are being tutored. So these are really identifying very specific learning skills that we need to um, really hone into. And again, we will use our data to identify the students who will be selected for tutoring services. Again. They can happen during the school day, before or after school as well. And um, we have provided schools with a list of interventions that are evidence-based and approved. And schools will use that list to determine what type of intervention is most appropriate for the student based on the skills that they need. And they will identify a plan for the students, the frequency for the intervention, and again, will document their growth and come back as teams to really determine next steps for students. Is it working? What's the next step as, as they move along? Um, I also, uh, if we can go to the next slide, want to just follow up by sharing that not only will our schools be looking at data on a regular basis through their leadership teams, but we have an evidence um, of learning work group that we have meeting on a monthly basis. It is a cross office team that will be looking at data and we will be looking at our report card data, our district data and our external data and we will also be just talking about the best practices that we see in schools and how we might be able to grow those best practices as we move and, and coordinate our work together. We will come back to the board meeting at the end of the semester, and we will share updates with you about the progress of our students. So at this time, I'll stop for any discussion. Well, I see the lights coming on. I, I have one question I'd like to ask you. You said that you're, you're looking at external vendors, 26 candidates to help before and after school. My question is, before school, would this be virtual? Because, well, what time would that be? Because the children have to get to school. A lot of them have to take the bus. So I was a little bit confused about the timing there. Yes. Excuse me. Yes, so it can be before school, after school. It depends on the, the schedule and what works best for the student. Um, but we do currently have families that prefer that option. Um, we have anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes before school. Some students are available for that instruction and uh, are, we are providing it to them. So we really are asking uh, our schools to work with families to figure out what is most appropriate for them. So you're not gonna decide who could do it before school? Or, no. Okay, because I was concerned that some have to take the bus. Yes and they could be on a while. Thank you. I saw Ms. Mandrowski. Yep, one's quick. Um, I just, in terms of it being virtual for not just um, the tutoring, but all intervention supports and whatnot, I'm assuming there will be some um, virtual and some in person, correct? If it's done during the school day, and a lot of schools have figured out in their master schedules how to make that happen, it happens face to face or in you know, small groups. Um, but right now, as a district, our recommendation for before and after is virtual. 
have we considered um, providing um, funding for like our teachers or whoever might want to stay after and provide tutoring to so, continue? Yeah, in so person. we are actually using our grant funds to provide stipends for our teachers who stay before and after school. When I say stay, I'm talking about in the virtual space um, before and after school. Um, you can't do it in person? We can do it in person. Our challenge right now is tra providing transportation. And it, we just have a lot of logistical issues going on right now. And so because we wanted to get this up and running as quickly as possible, we, are, we will look to do that in the near future. Okay, well my comment then was just going to be making, I do to, um, uh, Ms. Silvestre asked my question earlier about the data um, between the difference between kids who, virtual instruction versus in-person instruction. So I was just gonna follow up with a, I, if we do see the ability to do in-person along with virtual, making sure that we're tracking who's doing what so that we can really evaluate how things are working and what may or may not be influencing outcomes. Yeah, so we'll come back to you at the end of the semester to, to share the difference and then we'll do the same at the end of the school year. Ms. Aluni. Yeah, um, my first question is about the intervention efforts. It sounds like there's a lot of logistics in managing, especially if students are gonna be pulled out of class to get their intervention and then put back in or before and after school. Um, who's in charge of coordinating that effort at each school? So each school will have a lead teacher that has been assigned and um, then our, uh, the individual that Mr. Murphy mentioned that we have in our central office meets with them um, to provide them any training they need to get the program up and running, identify staff, all of the pay, all of those types of things that will that should be coordinated. We, we share with them how to track the students and get them into the system and all of those pieces. Um, is that position listed on each school's website? Is it easy for families to be able to pinpoint who that individual might be? It should be, yes. And these positions were advertised um, online where everyone could see. And now this month, schools are sort of in the process of. So as Ms. Hazel mentioned, I think we have 130 lead teachers who've been hired. Our goal is 206 for all of our schools. So that'll be being stood up throughout the month and as we approach um, no, the beginning of the second marking period. So we will certainly, that's a, a good suggestion for us to follow up on to make sure that that's very transparent of who to contact at the school. Yeah, just so families know if they have any concerns or questions about that process. Um, and then I appreciate your uh, transparency about the conflicting pressures between uh, punctuality and uh, quality of the tutoring service and being virtual or in person. Is there a timeline for when you're aiming to get the tutoring programs to be in person? Not a specific timeline. Our, our urgency right now is to, is to begin. Um, as soon as possible. Um, when we come to you in November regarding the external providers um, who provide mostly virtual services, um, you know, that's gonna be another, another layer for us to begin. And so by that point, we will have virtual tutoring underway by MCPS staff. We will begin virtual tutoring with the, tutoring with the external providers. And then as we look ahead to the rest of the year, absolutely 100% we wanna create space for in-person tutoring. Um, as Ms. Hazel mentioned, the barrier of our, of our transportation issue right now and being able to provide that at scale district-wide um, is obviously a big challenge. So hence our urgency to begin virtual now. So we will keep you updated on that and how that timeline looks, especially as we look at the second half of the year. Right, right. I think it might be worth just putting a, a date out there, even if it's just a goal in mind for accountability's sake, because as we all know in the data we just saw, um, being face-to-face -face makes a, a large difference for a lot of our students. Thank you. Ms. Harris. Yeah, thank you. And I, I appreciate, Mr. Murphy, you're using the word urgency because um, my concern is that uh, the end of the first marking period is next week and um, that's 25% of the school year gone and we don't have the tutoring programs set up yet. And so um, all deliberate speed so that we can get the students the supports that they're needed. Um, the, a quick clarifying question. In the data that you were sharing in the early part of this presentation change um, last year to this, 
Are we talking fall to fall or spring to fall when we're talking change? It's a fall to fall. It's fall to fall. Okay. And do we have or can we get, for the students that have been in our school system for at least three years, trend data so that we can see how they were doing on these, you know, you know, meeting grade level expectations before the pandemic impacts hit us. So the, you know, we'd be looking, I guess, at fall 18, um, spring and fall 19, and then comparing how they're achieving, after, you know, pre-pandemic and then af as the pandemic has progressed. Is that something we can get? We would be able to provide some of that information. One thing to keep in mind is we would typically lose some of our primary kids because they wouldn't have taken right. these assessments. Right. Um, and so the optimal grade level we would be able to share that picture with would be our middle school students who possibly were here at least three, three years because then we can go back to how they looked in um, elementary school. So we can work on that. And another question I had is looking at the performance data that we gathered in the fall map, and I think everybody knows that that was a huge challenge to stand up testing so soon uh, after school started. But have we disaggregated the data to look at students who participated, I guess not participated based on showed up one day, but actually largely completed or completed a summer school class in the relevant content area so we can see whether those students seem to be performing better than their peers who didn't participate in summer school? Yes, we are actually actively working on analysis around the impact of students participating, participating in summer school as measured by MAP. So what we showed you today was the pre and post assessment. Yep. And so what we are working on right now is looking at how did they end their school year last year in the spring on MAP, and then how did they start in fall? So we're continuing to work on that, and that will come to you soon. Okay, um, great. Um, and then uh, you mentioned the, the t tutoring programs that we're standing up. Students are going to be identified who are struggling to meet grade level expectations and benchmarks. What about students who want, who are struggling? Maybe they are not in that risk zone, but they want that tutoring. Is there an opportunity that we are clearly communicating to them so they can, part they can request to be part of the tutoring programming? Yes, and that's what I was speaking to um, related to the external, one of the external vendors that we will bring to you as for recommendation um, will be someone that if students are not selected by their school, they could still receive tutoring services through this external partner. Okay. Um, and then just a comment that I'll bring forward that I received from um, students that I've been, you know, talking with around the system um, and multiple students from multiple different high schools, and that is... Um, students that have probably already gotten past the Algebra II mark in their in, you know, MCPS trajectory, but because of all the content lost last year and the learning disruption, they're, they're struggling mightily, in their, particularly in their math and foreign language classes so far this year. And for a lot of these students, because again, they've passed that Algebra II benchmark, they're they're not being offered a lot of supports, um, and they're pretty much going to their counselors and dropping classes, and then and choosing something else. Is there something that we are doing to try in the school improvement plans, maybe, to get maybe content areas in schools to kind of circle around those students who are clearly struggling so far this year, but aren't going to be in those groups that are identified because they're past that point in their in you know K-12 trajectory. Well, I just wanted to mention again the external providers that we are reviewing their proposals. One of our expectations and requirements is that um, students with that profile who may be in an advanced course or an upper level math, uh, we expect the providers to be accessible to students in any courses that meet that criteria. So if a student is in that upper level math class or upper level world language class, uh, we, our requirement in our RFP was that external providers would be able to address that need. Um, and I would just mention too, so I heard that same comment from students from multiple high schools, but they were also saying that they're similarly struggling in their foreign language classes, but are finding their schools are sort of circling those wagons and providing supports. So I'm not sure what that difference is. Perhaps it's because it, you know, you don't have a foreign language class to 
move to if you're, so I, I don't know. But anyway, I am hearing those comments from students. Thank you. And we, uh, we have discussed that actually. And, and for our school-based staff um, through the tutoring program, we have looked at having some world languages teachers and if not available at the school, then using the virtual opportunities so that students can get support maybe from someone who teaches at a different school. But we do acknowledge that the world languages is a challenge for many of our students and we want to be able to support them. Mm -hmm. Ms. Silvestri. Um, thank you for all this information. I, it's a lot to process and I think this is why it's helpful to have the PowerPoints ahead of time so that we can mm -hmm review and, and uh, have time to um, think about it and ask the right questions. Um, I th my questions, um, one of them I think is related to what Ms. Harris asked for. I'm trying to put in context the map data provided, so it would be helpful to see previous year's map data starting with pre-pandemic, which is 2019, 20, 2021, and then 21, 22, just to see the, the trajectory and, and you know, what does it mean to be 50% now? What was it pre-pandemic? Um, in terms of communication with families, so if I am a parent of a child who does need support to catch up, how much communication has been given at this point? Um, how are they involved in their child's improvement? So, so schools are reaching out to families um, about the tutoring opportunities if they've been identified. We have a lot of schools who've already gotten started. Um, and so, you know, they're reaching out, but we will make available through our communications team and put something out for schools to share when we have our external partners. If, school, if a student has not been identified through the school, that they have another option for receiving additional support. But if the school has identified a student, then the expectation is that they are reaching out to that family to get those supports and, and coordinating when it will happen. Um, and if it's happening during the school day, um, and sometimes you know people ask how might that happen during the school day, at the elementary level, it could be pulling them in a small group during their rotational block so they're not missing the um, whole group instruction, but they're, they're being pulled as a part of like a center for instruction, or it could be that somehow the schedule has been modified slightly so that students can receive that instruction. Um, so we will um, make sure to communicate to our schools and let families know if that's happening during the school day. We want, certainly want families to know that that's happening. But after school and, and before school, they're reaching out to families. Um, and um, there are schools that have a lot of students that are, have fallen behind and there are schools that have less so. So how are we supporting the schools that have, have seen a lot of impacted students uh, due to learning loss in the pandemic? Uh, you know, uh, all schools are not equal. Every child is not, doesn't come to the school with the same kind of needs. So it, the support needs to be differentiated and I'm curious to see how we're doing that. Yes, uh, I'll make a comment there. One, as we've been having this discussion tonight, I know we provided some clarification around tutoring and clarified that this is for students who need a boost. We talked a little bit about intervention updates, and so we know that intervention are oftentimes programs, research-based programs that we've worked with and seen the success in and want to utilize those programs as it relates to a specific student need that we have. But the one thing we haven't talked about, and we should come back and talk about this, because I think intervention goes beyond just a, a program for students, but it really does go to holistically what are all of these students, where are all these students in every single school? What is impacting their learning or not? Um, if they're not learning, what's impacting that? And then what are we doing instructionally on a regular basis? Intervention is going to help us address some of the gaps that exist in learning, but we also have to couple that with the regular first instruction that's happening in the classroom for those students. And so that's when we get down to the weeds of who are those students that school improvement plan calls that out specifically for schools and the instruction in the building has to address that. And so, yes, tutoring, interventions, but then it is that, that first instruction uh, 
that does ultimately help us address this need over time. I'm just trying okay. to imagine a, an elementary school classroom where three students need additional support versus an elementary school classroom where 20 students need additional support. How is that teacher with the 20 getting the help to move 20 kids forward versus Correct. a school with a classroom with three, which is a very different scenario. So a big part of the vision of what we've been discussing over time and we're going to continue to discuss is that professional development. Now this is prior to the pandemic where we spent a lot of time elevating the importance of differentiating instruction for students in the classroom and what does the teacher need to know about understanding that student performance to be able to tailor the instruction for that particular student's need, whether it's a group of three of them, or five of them, or 20 of them in the classroom. Um, and, and that's a, a secular process that, that we have to continue to um, protect, and that's why the professional learning to support the teachers to be able to do that, and knowing exactly who those learners are in every classroom in all of our schools is important. And I, I hope as we talk about the school improvement plan and the process of it, it really does get at how this is a daily investment in that process and not just something that we're doing. Because that truly is what's gonna go or make a difference in the long haul of us addressing these gaps combined with intervention and tutoring, which I see as, in a lot of ways, secondary. It is secondary. It, and just to add to that, Dr. McKnight, part of this, those six areas, one of them is assessment for learning. And so we really do expect our teachers to be using very short, quick, formative assessments at the end of a lesson to gain the understanding of what students under, know and understand in a lesson and take that to their planning. Um, and so when schools and teachers are planning together, they're able to determine we've got 20 students or we have three students and what are our next moves going to be for those students. The whole group instruction is, is really where we expect that grade level instruction to take place and then as, as teachers are moving along with those smaller groups, that's where they may um, differentiate slightly to meet the needs of uh, other students. The tutoring and intervention is, is second to what's happening in the classroom with the first instruction. A final question, I promise. Uh, the final slide is about the evidence of learning work group. What will be the first data set that you will put your hands on to say this is working or this is not working? So we meet, our first meeting is on Thursday. We will look at math data. And uh, we have area directors who will be sharing what is happening in their area as it relates to the math data and really highlighting some um, strategies and plans that are working really well, looking at some schools that have some really um, strong instructional practices that we can discuss amongst the uh, cross office. And then the next time we meet, we will be looking at report card data and getting a sense of how students are doing. And oftentimes we see a disconnect between the report card data and our assessment data. So having some conversations about that and what that means and where we might need to move to support our schools. Thank you. I had a quick question. So as part of the way that we get there, Ms. Hazel, um, the, um, is, it, is it the Lavinia group? Who is that? I, I forgot that quickly. We had um, a reading specialist come here to talk to us about the program at their school. We're going to put it into other schools. But we were able to hear from her, and I'm sorry I can't remember her name in the school, but they were getting that coaching, like the instant um, that um, instant um, response or feedback from the coaches. Is that part of what we're doing to get our, some of our teachers where we need them to be, to be able to help support our students in the classroom? Is that some of the work? Yeah, so we're doing that with uh, a variety of consultants, but we're also the support that central office staff in school support and improvement and in curriculum, special education, ESOL, we're all going out and supporting schools to do the same type of work. Um, coach, coaching, 
planning with teachers and teams of teachers, looking at the data, really gaining an understanding of what it means, talking about those next steps for instruction. So all of those types of things are occurring. And then we're using those consultants to just learn some of the other things that are happening outside the district that we can use to build our system. Okay, I have a question. Um, Ms. Harris and I think Ms. Silvestri asked for some trend data. Now, if I'm not mistaken, my training tells me you wouldn't have a trend because the trend would have been broken because the students you're going to be comparing them to did not have the same level of instruction as the kids did in 2018. By that, I mean they were in virtual learning, which is a whole different set of circumstances from the set of circumstances that our third graders might have had in 2018 where they had been in front of a teacher for kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and starting to third grade. So I'm trying to figure out the value of that. What would I do with that? So last fall, we actually brought and did a comparison of pre-pandemic results to you know our 2020, which we had to kind of jump into that. And one of the values is being able to see, are they starting in a similar way from students who were in person compared to their starting virtually? And so that's why for today's presentation, it was a comparison of last fall where they started virtually to this fall where they're now back to in person. So it, it could provide you with an opportunity to see, are, are they bouncing back? Are they more similar to what they were looking like when they were in person back in the 2018, 19, or the fall of 2019? It was the but fall it's of not 20. a true trend, because for it to be a true trend, when they have, have to have been in the same circumstances, well, the, the data would, that is one factor, and it could be a limitation of how you examine the data or interpret the data, but it would still provide you with a good proxy to say, are third graders looking similar to, to the third graders from the previous year? And part of the caveat that Ms. Harris elevated, I think it was Ms. Harris, in terms of um, looking at students who were at a minimum in the district for three years, like we're following the same groups of students that can also provide you a good opportunity to see kind of how their performance is either going up and down or remaining constant. Absolutely, I just wanted to add in, we, we're definitely gonna be learning over some time uh, about all of this. I mean, I, I'm already thinking about the students who would have come in this year as uh, kindergartners who may have a very different experience from you know, the kindergartners over the last two years. And so really kind of looking at these cohorts of students, those who were impacted by COVID, those who were not, um, I, I think it's, we're going to have a difference that we look at, but uh, I think it is important for us to look at how are we determining what are factors that exist within you know, one group that may, may or may not be different from another, or what are some consistent things that we see occurring with students learning who are within one group versus the other. So, I think this is a conversation, you see what I mean? I think that part is important, but I was just talking about the idea of the kids in third grade now did not have the same experience of the kids in third, third grade in 2018. So I was trying to figure out what kind of caveat are you putting around the data to give it meaning? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, uh, Ms. Wolf. We thank you for bringing that uh, point forward. And I think as we move as we continue to bring data to the table, we can distinguish that if, if that helps us to have a better understanding of who the students are that we're looking at and what the factors are that are impacting them. One other part that I know will help us also better understand the implementation of all of this is bringing our teachers and our staff back to say how all of this is playing out. I know right now the team is presenting this in terms of what we've been planning to do and what we're going to be implementing, but it's also gonna be as important, and we just looked at a lot of survey data, for us to bring our staff in to hear from them. How are these interventions being implemented? How is the tutoring going? And how is the professional learning that we're planning for truly equipping teachers to address the very thing that Ms. Silvestri was bringing up if you have a classroom of 24 students and 20 of them are struggling with this, you know, what does that mean for your instruction or vice versa? So we look I forward agree, to that. but I hope that we bring in some actual teachers because I'm seeing differences between how principals perceive the information and how teachers Absolutely. are perceiving it. So I would like to hear from the boots on the ground, so to speak. 
Thank you. Or does anyone else have anything they'd like to ask about this before we move on? Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Dr. Addison, I don't know how you put this, how you put all of this together, but you are doing it and it makes, you know, it's very clear and understandable. So I thank you. Next we have item 11, the school year calendar. I'm going to give Dr. McKnight's people a chance to get here. Dr. McKnight, do you want to get started? Yes, I think we have everyone. So uh, thank you so much. We are going to discuss today our 2022-23 uh, school calendar. We're going to provide an update to the board and the development of where we are with the calendar. The staff has developed three school year calendar scenarios that reflect the discussion and the direction of the policy management committee in its review held on October 21st, um, 2021. We will share these scenarios and highlight a key element of each one um, for the board. As in previous years, we have considered uh, the beginning of the school year and the end of the school year, as well as mandated holidays and the traditional extended winter and spring breaks. Before my colleagues share details of each scenario, I do want to elevate two particular interests uh, as we begin this conversation. The first is holidays and religious observances continue to be a common topic of interest expressed in our calendar engagement settings. Um, the calendar scenarios recognize the mandated holidays set forth by Maryland law. Additionally, MCPS continues to engage stakeholders and other cultural and religious observances, and we are committed to acknowledging the correct days for observances and being consistent from year to year. So I bring that forward as um, a key component that has continued to come up in this conversation around calendar. The second is our focus on professional development. We just finished a conversation about the importance of professional learning for our teachers. And while I did note that prior to the pandemic, we were working with our teachers and we expressed the importance of differentiation for learning, well, now we have our students coming into our classrooms, as you know, in very different places whether they're all in the same classroom um, in, 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 who may have similar needs or those who are within a classroom have varying needs. It, it is dynamic that a teacher has to continue to work through and understand what every single student needs within that classroom and how instruction needs to be differentiated for them. Professional development in that light is critical for student success. Historically, MCPS has built in uh, calendars, I'll say over the years, professional development activities um, other than grading and reporting. But if you look over the past few years, essentially professional development has been acknowledged in grading and reporting days only. Um, but that has not occurred consistently in our system. And as a result, I want to say that as our priority moving forward, knowing that we have to invest the time in teacher professional learning, that in all three draft calendars, you will see three early release days, okay? Focus particularly on uh, teacher staff development, professional learning. One in September, one in December, and one in March. So I did wanna highlight that because there's it's a theme connected here in the conversation about student learning and how that connects to the calendar. I'll also say, and I'm excited that we have uh, Ms. Edwards at the table today because when we talk about the, the student calendar, we also have to acknowledge while we need time for teacher professional learning, we also acknowledge that there's time that that signifies time that students are not in school with their teachers. So what are they doing? And how are families able to still have services for them? So we've started this conversation in the spring and are able to talk a little bit today about where we are in this out of school time initiative. We want that to actually complement an option for families and students when students are out of school and we're addressing the professional learning needs of the staff, okay? So I look forward to that discussion. 
So we will prepare the scenarios the board would like to put forward for a public review. We will launch a communication and uh, outreach effort to ensure that our community is aware of the conversation and possible directions for the development of the 22-23 calendar. The identified draft scenarios will be available for public comment and uh, there will be an opportunity to provide uh, feedback on the MCPS website. Simultaneously, we also have our um, two schools in uh, our COLA and Roscoe Nix, our elementary schools that are working through the elements of the innovative school year calendar. So that will align with the scenarios for the traditional calendar as well. The recommendation to the board for final approval will be at the December 2nd meeting with which will include a single traditional and an accompanying, accompanying innovative scenario. So following the school calendar presentation, Ms. Jeannie Dawson, Chief of the Office um, of Finance and Operations, and Mr. Doug Hollis, Executive Director in the Office of Finance and Operations, and Ms. Dana Edwards, Chief of District-wide Services and Supports, will share information about our work related to the calendar and out of school time and how the two are going to complement each other. Um, as a note, we uh, calendar scenarios with an increase in professional development time does again indicate the early release days that I spoke about. So as we have that conversation, uh, please engage knowing that uh, that's how the two are fitting together. So that's why we included that as a component of the calendar discussion. So with that, I'm looking forward to this conversation and I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Dawson, to begin the presentation. Well, hello, and we again are glad to be here to talk about the calendar. So thank you, Dr. Knight. Greetings, uh, Ms. Wolf and members of the Board of Education. This is our annual opportunity to present the Policy IDA school year calendar. As stated, and I quote in Policy IDA, in addition to approving a school year calendar on an annual basis, no later than the end of December, the board shall adopt a contingency calendar indicating the days that could be used to make up IDA, end quote. I'll be presenting with Doug today. This presentation is uh, an update for you on the collaborative work of staff alongside internal and external stakeholders and to provide the opportunity to discuss those three scenarios for school year 22-23. Next slide, please. As we look at the timeline and the actions, um, just to recall, last year we suspended policy IDA during the pandemic and did not adopt the calendar until March. As we did not know how we would be directed by the Maryland State Department of Education and what requirements would be before us, certainly at the local level. So we're pleased that you know, that work has, has rolled directly into our new planning for this, this year. This summer, MCPS staff began to discuss the calendar for FY22-23 uh, FY internally, and this included the conversations, as Dr. McKnight noted, with the innovative schools and the implementation teams for those schools. Over the last few months, uh, Mr. Hollis has met with a large cross-office group, including Office of Teaching and Learning, General Counsel, Labor Relations, Shared Accountability, ERSKI, athletics, communications, testing and assessments team, and student leadership. And I'm sure Ms. O'Looney can talk about that. Um, we've also met with our stakeholders, including students, parents, interfaith groups, community members, principals, and teachers in various settings. Next slide, please. So last week, we met with the Policy Management Committee uh, to discuss the scenarios, and we want to thank uh, Ms. Mandrowski and that committee. They have reviewed our progress to date and provided feedback. We look forward to today's discussion so that we can talk about the feedback from the full board as well. And we'll use this discussion and the input from the public to help shape the final recommendation for the SY 22-23 calendar for board action during the December 2nd board meeting. With that, I will turn it over to Doug to continue our presentation. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ms. Dawson. Here we share a little bit about our engagement we have done to date and our plans for the future. As Ms. Dawson mentioned, we have had a lot of preliminary and small group discussions to get to this point. 
It is important for the development of the calendar to continue to be a dialogue with many groups and individuals from our larger parent community, employee associations, student community, and individuals who bring additional perspectives connected to their personal heritage, culture, and faith. Next slide, please. Additionally, our communications team will assist us to make sure our community is aware of the work, the potential scenarios, and have an opportunity to provide feedback in that. Following our meeting today, we, while, we have, while we were collecting public feedback and comments throughout November, we will continue to meet with internal and external stakeholders in small groups to make sure we are all capturing valuable qualitative input throughout. Next slide. Before we proceed in sharing scenarios, we do want to highlight the parameters as established by Annotated Code, Chapter 7, Article 103. The list before you represents the holidays mandated by code or Maryland law that must be recognized by public schools in Maryland. You will see the dates for each holiday here. We will point them out as we walk through the scenarios as we move forward. Next slide. As you recall, the requirements around school year starting following Labor Day and ending by June 15th was addressed in state legislation a few years ago. This is no longer a restriction in our calendar. Our scenarios show what a before Labor Day start and an after Labor Day start looks like. Spring break in all the scenarios includes six full days and two weekends. As shared by Dr. McKnight, professional development is something we continue to hear feedback about. In the scenarios, we have addressed this with a few more early release days throughout the year to ensure our instructors and school teams have professional development opportunities together. We believe this to be beneficial for all of our students as well. The Innovative School Implementation Team has worked alongside us in development of these scenarios and are prepared to have accompanying scenarios as we present a recommendation in December. We have, we have three slides that we will show you today. I will walk fully through the first, scenario A, and then highlight the differences in scenario B and scenario C. As the case in past years, all scenarios can be modified. The modifications could potentially include elements of another scenario. The scenarios are meant to demonstrate possibilities and impacts based on how the dates fall for school year 22-23. Next slide. And let's go to the next slide. We'll begin to look at scenario A here. Labor Day is Monday, September 5th. This scenario shows the school year beginning on Tuesday, August 30th, designated in the top right corner in the light pink color. The Tuesday start shows here, shown here exists to provide the potential for six days of pre-service for staff at the start of the year. September has the Labor Day holiday and a non-instructional day on September 26th. October the 5th is another non-instructional day. September 26th is the same day as Rosh Hashanah, and October 5th is the same day as Yom Kippur. In October, there's a professional development day on October 24th seen here in light pink. This is the date of Diwali. There are a number of additional professional development days throughout the calendar in the teal or greenish color. These days all align with the full day for grading and planning at the end of each quarter. The first half of the year has the traditional holidays. Also in November, there is Tuesday, November 8th, that is noted as a holiday for election day this coming fall. The Thanksgiving holiday is preceded by three early release days, with that Monday and Tuesday being designated for parent-teacher conferences. In all the scenarios, winter break will begin on Friday, December 23rd. Students will return to school Tuesday, January the 3rd. In scenario A, spring break precedes the Friday before Easter and the Monday after Easter. 
The last day of school in this scenario is Thursday, June the 15th. Makeup days are in the end of each scenario and throughout the calendar. As we noted earlier, there are some yellow early release days throughout the calendar. We bring your attention to September the 14th, December the 7th, and March the 15th. The other early release days align with quarterly midterms or parent-teacher conferences as noted for Thanksgiving week. Lastly, Lunar New Year and Eid al Tour are days that have been professional development days in past calendars. Neither of these are displayed in these scenarios, in this scenario. As of now, both of these days fall on weekends for 2023 and have no direct impact to the instructional calendar. Lunar New Year is Sunday, January the 22nd. Eid al Fatur is Friday, April 21st. We continue to work with the Muslim faith community and county partners to correctly identify and reflect the date of the observance for Eid al Fatur and note that the final recommendation may show an update according to pending additional information and conversations. Next slide, please. The major difference in scenario B is the start and ending date. Scenario B is an example of starting after Labor Day on Tuesday, September the 6th. The last day of school is a week later, Thursday, June the 22nd, in this scenario. Spring break here lands in the same place as in scenario A. The holidays, non-instructional, and early release days displayed here are the same as you saw in the previous scenario. And lastly, I want to turn to the next slide, which is scenario C. It's similar to scenario A as it begins on August the 30th and ends on Thursday, June the 15th. Spring break is the only difference or significance in scenario C. Spring break here lands following the Friday before Easter and the Monday after Easter. The holidays, non-instructional and early release days are all similar. I also want to note that in all the scenarios, quarter three, right before spring break, there, are, there is a professional development day. And because of that, spring break has that additional day where students would be out of school. We look forward to hearing your comments and ongoing input about this and from the public. This concludes the presentation of the calendar, and so now I turn it over to Ms. Dana Edwards for an update on out-of-school time. Thank you, Mr. Hollis, as well as uh, Ms. Dawson. Good evening, Ms. Wolf and members of the board. I'm excited to be here today to give you a status update on out-of-school time. As you, as you heard from Mr. Hollis in the three calendars, the three draft calendars that were shared with you this evening, we do have some increases around our early release days and professional development days that we want to be able to really be able to provide an opportunity for our teachers to have that time to come together and learn. Anytime we have that, that's a time when our students are not in school. And this increase in days when school is not in session creates a potential void for many of our students to have access to structured activities and programs that would maintain their engagement and ways to remain actively engaged. Days when schools are closed also present childcare concerns for many of our families. And out of school time or OST creates a bridge and closes a gap for us. As a district, we want to focus on how do we meet the academic and social needs of students through out of school time offerings on unscheduled school days. This evening, I would like to provide you um, some existing efforts that we're doing with out of school time, talk about what we believe and what we'd like to see for the future, and talk around some collaborative reimagining work to consider recommendations for out of school time that we'll hear about in more detail later in the year. If we go to the next slide, I wanna take an opportunity to just talk about what is out of school time. And after the school bell rings on any given day, from the hours of four to eight, on weekends, professional days, in the summer, spring break and winter break are all times when school is not in session. 
These are examples of when students are not in the prescribed academic program that is offered during the school day. During the times I mentioned, our students may be unsupervised, they may have food insecurity. This is time that may create safety concerns as well, and there may be limited to varying ways for students to act actively engage in structured activities. We are focusing on examining the use of that time when school is not in session that the CDC defines as a supervised program that young people regularly attend when school is not in session. As a district, we want these offerings um, to be in ways in which we keep kids engaged um, when school day is over and on days when school is not in session. This work directly aligns with the board's strategic plan, areas of academic excellence and well-being and family engagement, as well as the DCIP focus areas of mitigating learning loss, a focus on our most poverty impacted schools and well-being support. When we think about a school time, what you see on the screen are three buckets that we're most familiar with, three different types of out of school time. And this is from the Wallace Foundation who has done a lot of research and really kind of undergirded that work. The first are specialty programs that we currently offer in MCPS, and they can include distinct programs that focus on things such as coding, a robotics club, or engineering club. The one thing to note with specialty programs is they can be offered after school. Sometimes they have meetings on the weekend, but they may not be offered at all school. They may be distinctive to certain schools depending on the available staff and or partnerships that are available. The second program that we are also familiar with are multi-purpose out of school time programs. These are traditional for us. And we know these as our traditional after school programs such as the art club, the drama club that we see in most of our schools across the district. And then the third bucket would be our academic programs. And we heard a presentation around our academic programs earlier, which would be similar to our summer school program is one of our examples of one of the largest out of school time programs that we have. In addition, we also have our George B. Thomas Learning Academy that takes place on Saturdays that does a combination of enrichment as well as providing students additional support to really undergird them as they move into their classrooms on a daily basis. But these are the academic programs that we know that meet that instructional need and continue to build enrichment. Whether it be a specialty program, a multi-purpose program, or academic, Three, these are three examples we currently have within our district. They can be and are offered also in, in conjunction with extracurricular activities and our athletics program. The time that we have not always leveraged as a district and that is critically important to remain engaged with students is on weekends, non-instructional days, and during winter and spring break. The current body of work that we will be focused on with the expansion of out of school time is one, I want to share with you some of the opportunities that we're piloting this year to see how things go so that we can really determine the logistics. And then two, we are also engaging a multi-stakeholder work group to reimagine out of school time for the coming school year. The next slide. I'd like to share with you two pilot areas that are a little bit different for this year for out of school time. Um, and it's important that we pilot on a very small scale because we are a large district to see how it works, take into consideration. So we, when we take it to scale district-wide, we have some learnings under our belt. We have um, forged partnerships this year, and these are not all of our partners, but with the collaboration with our Montgomery County government partners and the Kid Museum to really look at how we offer opportunities to students on non-instructional days. November 4th, which is next Thursday, we're proud to be able to say that we will be working with um, the Montgomery County Rec Department to be able to offer opportunities to students K through five at 14 of our rec departments. We will also be offering scholarships to students to be able to go and participate in these activities that will be all day also through the city of Rockville and the Gaithersburg Recreational Site. We also have two child care centers at Rolling Terrace and Strathmore who will also be able to serve as students, which will give us about 900 opportunities for K through five students across the district to be able to participate. 
Students will participate in camp-like activities and do music, rock climbing, basketball, and flag football. And we've had the opportunity to partner in terms of the um, advertising of those programs. In addition, in collaboration with the Children's Opportunity Fund and the Kids Museum, we are again focused on Rolling Terrace and Strathmore Elementary Schools to be able to pilot a 12-week STEM program with a focus on the arts that will be offered from 4 to 6 p.m., two days a week for K through five students through their aftercare program. So these are different than what we've done in the past. And these are examples of such programs that we'd like to see in terms of expansion and as we work with our uh, stakeholder group for the coming year. On the next slide, you'll be able to see just a table that reiterates some of the offerings on the days this year that we'd like to focus the pilot on. But the bulk of our um, collaboration with the Montgomery County Rec Department, two areas that I did not talk about that would be different for us and that as a system is kind of uncharted territory is winter break and spring break. And being able to use at least one of those days to be able to provide structured activities for our students to be able to participate and our families to be able to send their children to on those days to be able to focus. So we're really excited about that and being able to provide that opportunity and being able to do something a little bit different than what we've done in the past. If we switch to the next slide, as we prepare for next year, it's really important that we, we reimagine the scope of out of school time and work collaboratively with many of our partners as well as our community organizations to really think about what this could look like on a larger scale. We've been engaged with a multi-stakeholder work group with just two sessions. And in two sessions, this fantastic group has come up with some of the things that you see on the screen here. We still have about maybe five or six more sessions to go where our goal has really been able to come up with innovative insights about equitable offerings and expansion for students of all ages. It's going to be critical and one of the things that came out is really to understand our current status with our programs. We do know that we have out of school time offerings at all of our schools. We've been able to uh, send out a survey to really understand from our principals what they're offering in those locations, as well as is there, are there any differences by locations. We also want to be able to engage with our central office staff to be able to understand the same thing and be able to build off of what we currently have in place, as well as to think anew around different areas. What's going to be critically important because these programs are for students, as well as for families, is to be able to engage with them authentically and really take some time to do some focus groups with our students and families and understand needs, understand desires, and understand how to build a program that that will be something that they would want to be able to be a part of in the coming years. And finally, as with any program, we want to really make sure we understand the impact. Is it working? Do our students have, are they showing any academic progress? How does it support their social emotional well-being and or engagement? Because if we spend time to reimagine, really create opportunities, we really would like to make sure that the impact is what we perceive and we can monitor it along the way. So it would be critical for us to do that from the very beginning as well as as we go out this reimagining process. On the very last slide, you will see some of the list of our stakeholders, about 42 people participate on our reimagining work group. And even though this is a consolidated group, one of the things that I've loved about this group is really thinking about who else we need to engage that's not at the table and how do we do that. There are asterisks next to some of our community partners that actually sit on the group and really help us. Um, and you saw that really are a part of some of our out of school time efforts. One of the biggest areas that this work group has really thought through is how can this be the great equalizer for students? How can we leverage technology so that if I'm in a different part of the county 
where another opportunity is being offered, how does the technology come in to be able to give me opportunities to sink into that without being in that space and not using my zip code as the predictor of what activities that I can access and which I cannot access. This, um, I look forward to bringing this topic back to the board in the spring to be able to share the broader recommendations from this committee. Um, what you saw earlier were just a few of the areas that we have discussed and we have found um, to be prevalent and relevant, actually, I'll say, within our first two meetings. Um, the recommendations to bring back will focus on some short, a short-term focus as well as a long-term focus in looking at expansion and implementation of out-of-school time for our district, as well as looking at how we leverage our community partnerships to support these programming. It will be critical, though, for us to consider the programmatic and sequential planning needs in the spring so that we can prepare for next school year in the best method possible. Ms. Wolf, I turn the presentation back over to you um, as you talk about not only the school calendar, but out of school time. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments at this time? Ms. Harris. Um, yep, yeah, thank you very much for this. Um, I'm particularly interested in the out of school time work. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I blanked on it. You mentioned that there are the two uh, Title I elementary schools that are piloting the collaboration um, with the Children's Opportunity Fund and Kid Museum are Strathmore and Rolling Terrace. Rolling Terrace. Thank you. And could you talk a little bit more about so the pilot offerings on non-instructional days on the slide you provided, which lists some of the activities that might be available? Is that only for? Strathmore and Rolling Terrace and the, the two child care facilities, or is that more expansive? That's more expansive. That's more expansive. Those activities are available at the 14 recreational facilities throughout the county. Um, it's not available at all of the facilities because some of the facilities are actually hosting vaccine sites as well as they're doing COVID testing or they may be under right. construction. But at those 14 st sites, students will have an opportunity to engage in some of the activities that you see there. There will also be indoor sports for them to take advantage of. And I want to, I want to, I want to say through the city of Rockville or Gaithersburg, one of those areas will take students to iFly so that they will actually go off of that particular campus. At the elementary schools, they will receive the curriculum through the Kids Museum, that STEM focus with arts as, a, as an undergirding for them. And so that will be through the child care centers that are there. Um, and that's almost like a build off of what they're doing after school already um, for that aftercare program. So children who go there after the school day, that's offered from four to six for them already. Um, however, they are bringing themselves into that November 4th space as well to be able to extend that opportunity for the full day. And I'm assuming these are free. The programming is free? The programming for the rec department is not free. However, we do have scholarships available that um, MCPS will provide through ESSER funds for our families who um, do have financial hardships and do want their children to be able to participate. And I don't think I've seen any specific information circulating about this opportunity. Do we have, have there, are there flyers that have been produced and translated and that are being distributed? We have flyers that have been produced and what we've typically done and what we, we are doing with this particular set, they are sent out to our principals to be able to send home through their weekly messages with their families. Um, we are in the process of translating the information on our own to be able to pass back to the rec department as well as for us to use internally. Um, we will also project it through Twitter as well as Facebook. In addition, the other component is because this, um, there are specific rec centers in certain parts of the county, we have the ability to kind of target our message to families in those particular parts of the county to push them to be able to look at this opportunity for their children. And, uh, and I apologize if I missed it, but is this for just elementary school students? This time it is for elementary school for November the 4th. 
um, as we build out the days, and this is a part of the learning, Ms. Harris, I think that you're getting to. Um, as we build out the learning, we know that we have to also look at our, um, our, our, our older children as well. As we reimagine for next year, we have to have K through 12 offerings. But because this is like a soft rollout with a pilot, the space in which we started in which we were able to offer something on this very first day was around the K through five area. And working with the Children's Opportunity Fund and the Kids Museum, we were trying to look at where there are established child care centers already in, some, in our Title I schools um, to be able to sink that opportunity there for students to be able to access and for parents to have something that was beyond that traditional four or five o'clock time frame. So the focus right now, at least for this part of the year, has been around the earlier, um, the, the, the early years um, for our children. Our goal as we move throughout the year, and especially during winter break and spring break, is how do we expand for our older students? The part that's, that, that is interesting, going back to my middle school principal days, is what are those students interested in so that they're actually participating? as well as our high school students, and is in-person or virtual better for them? So that's going to be critical for us, especially even though we're doing the reimagining around out-of-school time for next year, the things that we will find out this year, we can also put toward programming for this year to be able to see if it works. It will also give us an opportunity to consider and drive our community partnerships and see who we have and or who we might need to continue to build this out. So it's a learning year. Um, so um, I'm just happy we have some days lined up. We have a lot of interest, um, but being able to build it out for next year, um, I won't say we'll be a powerhouse next year, but we'll be stronger in terms of foundation because it will be based on interest, feedback, and then we'll have the data backing to see is it working along the way. Thank you, I, and I would encourage us too to maybe consider working with our county newcomer partners because we know it's our older students. Mm -hmm. Our school to prison pipeline data is crystal that those students are particularly at risk, some of them, when they're not in school um, for lots of reasons. So um, maybe working with those county partners who are already looking for culturally responsive therapeutic recreation opportunities for some of those students, um, we could look to, you know, lean on their expertise to, to stand up some of this work for our older students. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Aluni. Yes, I, I want to thank all of you for the work you put into this, especially again, Mr. Hollis, for coming out to my SMOB Advisory Council meeting on a weekday, 8 p.m., really appreciate that. Um, this was something I brought up at our Policy Management Committee meeting, but I wanted to bring it up again in front of the whole board um, in case there was any discussion or objection. Um, putting every holiday, or as much as we know of, on the calendar, even the ones that we chose or could not recognize with a day off of school or a professional day, um, I just think that it, it, it's best for transparency and also just to recognize the cultural and religious diversity of our community. Um, I think it would be a positive addition, but I don't know if our board members have any concerns, reservations about that. I would only wonder, and I don't know the answer to this, so I would have to defer to, to um, Stephanie. Some of those are religious holidays, and I don't know whether or not that's appropriate. I know we, we have, I said some of them are religious holidays, and while, you know, I support religious holidays and welcome anyone, I don't know if it's appropriate to list them on the school calendar. So I think that um, this document that we're working on is the um, preparing the calendar. I know that in the end, our comprehensive calendar contains this information um, as part of your uh, consideration of the calendar because we base openings or closing rather on operational um, need that it may not be appropriate to, to list the religious holidays on the calendar as if we are considering them um, 
if they are consideration for the calendar itself as opposed to the operational needs of the district. I know that we do include this list in the comprehensive calendar as a, as a reference for all staff. I think that's a more appropriate place for, the, for that. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? Ms. Silvestri. Um, calendar question, is there any benefit instruction-wise to having uh, option C, which puts spring break um, a little later than we usually have it? Does it give us more, I don't know, is there any reason, <laughs> rhyme or reason for having it a little later? It, it really, um, as, as you noted, um, there's a question of does it impact us instructionally? I, I believe as we think about the assessments that we have for our students towards the end of the year, there is a period that opens up in April. Um, I'm not sure that there's a benefit. Uh, some of the feedback that we have heard is once those assessment windows open up and we have the opportunity to begin that for students, um, it is something that is preferred. Some of the high school principals have noted uh, when considering IB um, and AP exams, um, just another day to kind of ground yourself or another week to ground yourself following spring break is something that is actually possibly more preferred or beneficial for students. Um, but they could see that students possibly individually by themselves could benefit from the study time during the spring break session. So it's really just a preference of um, what we feel feels right more than anything else. In the number of days in particular, um, in scenario one and three, there are, they have the same amount of days, 92 days in the first semester and 90 days in the second semester. If you look at scenario B, it's 88 days in the first semester and 94 days in semester two. Mr. Hollis, you're saying that uh, for those students that have to test, it is beneficial for them to have spring break later than usual because... We've heard both. So some of them uh, uh, allow and, and like being still in school and having that, assess that, that time leading up to those assessments in the instructional setting. Some of those students um, who are some of our higher achieving students are individuals who prefer to do that independently and say that they could still do it under the, pr the premise of spring break and then lead directly into it. Okay, thank you. And then for the out of school time discussion, um, I'm assuming that there's some, maybe you mentioned it, I missed it, research that shows that children that are engaged in out of school time perform better academically. Is that why we're doing this? That is correct. One reason is students do perform better academically. There's also research that shows, and there have been other districts who have been doing this for years, um, mainly in, I will use Washington DC as an example, New Mexico as an example. There's a space when after school, if students do not have opportunities or places to go, it can create safety concerns for them for others, what they're doing in their community as well, um, and also a component around food insecurity. If there's a student who is going home and there's nothing for them to eat. So we really want to look at how do we not only provide things that they're interested in, but during the time that we do have them, how do we transport our students and how do we feed them as well? So we, we recognize that our calendar does create the opportunity, one, but what we also learned from the pandemic and we continue to hear over and over is that direct engagement, um, not being home, not you know being around others and really kind of engaging students beyond the academic component. So um, when we do come back in the spring and as a follow-up to be able to provide some different areas of research that do support the work that we're doing and why it's critical to move it forward. I don't know if now or in the future, um, I didn't hear much about transportation, how kids would get from mm -hmm. home to the rec centers. Uh, scholarships can be a barrier to families. In the old days, to get a rec department scholarship, you had to go to central office to process the scholarship. I hope it has changed, but that's a huge barrier in accessing scholarships. And uh, finally, I know that the Children's Opportunities uh, folks are 
interested in piloting, maybe you're doing it already, uh, out of school time after summer school next year. That was a big um, point of theirs this past summer is, okay, summer school's over at 1230, now what? What are the kids going to do um, after that? So I wonder if now or in the future when you have your f plans more fully developed, you can um, share some thoughts about that. I'm glad you raised that point around after summer school. Um, we do have members um, from the Children's Opportunity Front Fund as well as other entities who serve on the work group. Um, and so we will be looking at other times like you highlighted. As far as transportation is concerned, we will not be offering transportation for the November 4th date, but we definitely want to look at that opportunity, not only for transportation, but also for lunch for students who do um, feed into some of those additional professional days that were listed for this year. So that is a, a very important component for us that we do want to look into because we don't want to create the barrier um, in any way that we can see fit. Um, scholarships would come through MCPS um, through the use of our ESSER funds. So we definitely want to use not, you know, there are 900 seats available at least for November 4th and probably for some of those other days, but we don't want it to be any way in which someone says, this is something I'd love for my kid to do. This creates a good space and they can't do it. What you're bringing up are some key points that we've heard in our reimagining, and I'm hoping that we'll continue to leverage those and kind of really shape those recommendations um, around those extended day opportunities. But we've also t heard about before school opportunities that we often kind of don't um, talk about or they're uncharted territories for us at this point in time. Thank you. Mr. Vestry, I'd like to uh, add on just a quick note about what you just mentioned. One of the reasons we have the parent groups on in the stakeholder group is so that they can be able to talk through what are gonna be some of these challenges that have traditionally existed for parents to get access to some of these things, whether it may be how do we bring the, make the scholarships one that is of ease to parents um, so that they aren't going through these processes that make it difficult to access. So that's why we have a lot of our parent representation within the work group to help us work through some of those specific details. And I did wanna circle back to this is all about innovation. So even for our older students, we're trying to solve a number of problems right now. This is also an opportunity for us to engage our older students in a different way. Like for instance, many of them, we want to come back into the workforce within MCPS. We also see this as an opportunity where they can come in, possibly work with uh, other staff and offices to get an understanding of training of things that they may want to prepare for in terms of job training that may have an interest in within our system. That's an opportunity for them. Another example is uh, community service. Uh, there's an opportunity for students who are still trying to figure out ways to connect with the community and serve in the community to be able to do that. And if we're the conduits for how we arrange for that partnership to happen, again, that is of ease to students, then they're more uh, uh, tenable to actually engage in those processes. So it truly is exciting because this is uh, an opportunity to, to address a number of ways that we can engage our students in the school system to set them up for success. Ms. Harris. Yep. Just one point, I would be remiss if I didn't mention again, as I have for many years, that um, as a former CTE teacher, um, all these early release days put a lot of uh, burden on our CTE instructors who are teaching, as I used to, two triple period classes, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. So when I see, for instance, three early release days lined up, that means my morning students are getting essentially nine days of instructional time, and my because I'm a triple period course, and my afternoon students are getting none. And so that's a reality, that's a real reality for all of our teachers who teach in our CTE programming. Because your, your students are in a double or a per, triple period class, you'll have one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And when you're trying to get them all to the same finish line at the same time, that imbalance of instructional time is quite a challenge. Just an observation. Thank you for the feedback. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other lights, so I want to thank you for the presentation. Thank you so much. Okay.
Okay, we're up to item 12. Are there any items that any board members wish to pull? Can I get a motion to move 12.1 through 12.4 and block? So moved. Second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Can I get a motion to move items 13.1 through 13.3? So moved. Block. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. 13.4, Ms. Aluni. Yes. Um, so in accordance with... Uh, the board's parliamentary procedure. We were originally supposed to vote on the resolution concerning financial literacy course and graduation requirement today, um, but our staff has asked us to move that to our next Board of Education meeting on November 9th, where we will also be having a conversation about um, other graduation requirements and the 0.5 increase by the state um, in health. So I would like to ask for a vote to suspend parliamentary procedure um, to vote on this resolution, new business resolution at the November 9th meeting. So is that a motion? You want to put that in the yes. form of a motion? I move to suspend parliamentary procedure suspend. and yeah. vote on That's November 9th. That's what you said. Go ahead. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Does anybody have any new business? Okay. Item number 14 is information only. And we have reached the point of adjournment. Can I get a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. I'm assuming nobody wants to discuss. <laughs> All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. We are adjourned.